the meeting is now being recorded. So um, good morning and welcome to a meeting of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. Um, uh, and good, good morning to everybody. As I was saying uh, right before we went live, it's nice to see everyone who I haven't seen in a little bit. And I see that Stephen Hamilton is now on. So I think the only person we're waiting on that we were expecting that we don't yet see is um, Carolyn Shining. Um, so I, first of all, I want to start this with you, Linda, because I understand that you're uh, somehow leaving us in a few weeks. Is that right? That's correct. And when are you retiring? Much deserved retirement? <laughs> My last day of work will be April 1st. Okay, so, oh, so I want to, exactly, rather than leaving this to the end of the meeting when we're all cranky and trying to, you know, move into our weekend and doing other things, I wanted to take a moment um, or a couple of moments because really, I think as you all know, we could not be doing our job the way that we've been doing it without Linda. Um, I mean, just look at, yes, we're all gonna applaud. Um, <laughs> I mean, just look at the material that's been sent out over the last weeks and the organization of it and the back and forth around it. That's been an extraordinary effort. And I honestly have no clue how on earth we would have gotten our arms around over 1300 comments uh, without that. I mean, that was a massive endeavor and that was just the most recent endeavor in the course of many endeavors involving this, you know, wonderful, but not always easy working group. Uh, so just thank you very much, Linda, and thank you for the next few weeks. But I, I wanted to make sure to say something is in case, especially we don't have an if we don't have an opportunity to all see each other um, before you go and do something hopefully more fun with your days. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank and you if, very much. if I could jump in, um, I'm obviously going to miss Linda tremendously. And um, when we get into the substance of staff's recommendations and talking about how to proceed, I, I do want to keep in mind this reality that um, the rock of the staffing for this effort is, is leaving us in less than four weeks. Um, with that in mind, I do though want to briefly introduce uh, folks that you may see on, on the screen here that you haven't seen before. Who Blair, are gonna... Can I interrupt for one second? Yes. Yeah. Carolyn Shining emailed me that she's in the public viewing and is asking to be brought in as a panelist. Okay, okay. I will take care of that. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I wanna introduce a, a duo that is gonna help me um, keep things moving along. Uh, and we're, we're never gonna match uh, Linda, but we've got two folks on board to help us. So the first is uh, Richard Schaffler. You could wave Richard. Uh, Richard is a consultant that has been working with the bar in a number of efforts. Um, Richard, if you could briefly introduce yourself and your background. For folks. Sure. Uh, thank you, Liam. Uh, and good morning or afternoon, depending where which time zone you're in, I guess. Um, I'm Richard Schaffler. I uh, worked with the, I started working in the Judicial Council of California back in back in the day, and then went from there to be the research director of the National Center for State Courts, where I, from which I retired in 2018, came back out to California and worked with the bar on the uh, beloved Appendix I report, uh, if that name rings the bell to anyone, basically looking at the bar's entire uh, committee and working group structure and trying to help uh, figure out how the bar could assess whether or not it needed to organize things differently. So I worked on that. I've worked with Leah on the um, special discipline case audit committee uh, last year and uh, and currently working with Kelsey Lyles, who's at the bottom of the, your screen perhaps um, on that as well. So uh, and familiar with a number of with the California court system of course and and how it's the same or different as uh, other systems in the country through my work at the National Center. So happy to uh, join. As Leah said, never never will be able to fill Linda's shoes and her amazing organizational abilities, but we'll do our best. And the next um, uh, partner in this effort is Kelsey Lyles. Who and if I could jump in for just one second um, before yes. Kelsey has a chance to tell us a little bit about herself. Um, I do see that Jason Solomon in the attendees has his hand raised. If there are other people in the attendees who wish to make some brief comments, if you could go ahead and raise your hands now so that we can see uh, kind of where we are by the time Kelsey's done telling us who she is. Hi, Kelsey. 
Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Kelsey Lyles. I'm newer to the state bar, but as Richard said, I'm working as Richard said, I'm working with him to support the client trust account protection program implementation and also some of our efforts to address disparities in the attorney discipline system. So I really look forward to working with you all to support the career professionals program. And my background is in legislative advocacy and public health. Kelsey's been at the bar now for a couple of months and was hired specifically to uh, back behind Linda. So she's been a great addition, but is, is new to us. So those are the folks that you hopefully will get familiar with um, as our work proceeds. Great. And um, I see we have a few hands. Why don't we do um, two minutes per person for public comment? We'll go ahead and do that now and then roll into our agenda um, items. And then I'll, I'll check in um, later during our meeting to see if there are other folks who wish to make comment at that time. For now, we'll take public comment from the four people who have their hands raised. Justice um, Petru, do you want me to take roll before we start that? We haven't sure. taken yet. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bashan? Here. Reynoldson? Here. Falmouth? Here. Fleischman? Here. Hamilton? Present. Harper? Here. Hartston? Here. Kirkmeyer? Here. McRae. Here. Olvera. Present. Justice Petru. Here. Uh, Robinson. Here. I understand uh, Judge Rubin is not joining us today. Um, Shining. Here. Sarush. Here. Spiro. Here. Um, I understand Claudia is not joining us or Judge, uh, oh, Judge Wiley. Yes, sorry. Here. And uh, Judge Yu, I believe, is not joining us. Yeah, Judge Yu will try to join us over her lunch break. Okay. Um, okay, so with that, we'll, we'll take four people for public comment, um, starting with uh, Jason Solomon, who had his hand up first. Okay, just a moment. Okay. And did you say two minutes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, Jason Solomon, Stanford Center on the Legal Profession. Um, I continue to support a robust version of this proposal, but oppose the recommended changes. Having said that, I understand that, for example, not allowing paraprofessionals to share ownership with lawyers is not likely to affect the immediate success of the program, and so may make sense for political reasons. But another recommended change, not allowing in-court representation, would seriously adversely impact the success of the program, and I hope is not made. In-court representation is particularly important and makes sense for several reasons. First, the lack of it is a big part of the justice gap. So taking that away would mean that the recommendation would address a considerably smaller share of the justice gap than it might otherwise. Second, this proposal is fundamentally about helping to level the playing field between those with resources and those with less. If one side has someone experienced to speak to a judge and the other side does not, that is an unfair playing field and clients know and feel that. You heard from Christina, the triple LT client from Federal Way, Washington who told you that having a triple LT was a humongous weight lifted off my shoulder. But she also said, I would have loved it if they could have spoken because it was really intimidating. Number one, being there in the court with the judge and also in my position where I'm trying to get non-parental custody of the kid. If paraprofessionals can't affirmatively speak in court, that has a compound adverse effect against their clients. If one side has a lawyer and the other a paraprofessional, there is a disincentive to settle if the lawyer knows that if they can just get before the judge again, they will have a decided advantage. Finally, the research shows that paraprofessionals do as well or better with advocacy in the kinds of cases covered here. You heard that directly from judges in Washington, Ontario, and indeed many of the existing proven models of lay representation in the US, including in California, are roles that are almost exclusively about advocating before judges. I'm referring to accredited representatives- 15 seconds left. In social security hearings. Finally, let's not give too much weight to the attorney generals uh, letter on this point. Um, it seems to me that letter is an invitation for discussion between the attorney general and judges on the working group, and I would hate for consequential decisions to be made based on that piece of paper that a busy elected <laughs> official happened to sign. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have uh, Janet Drobinski. Hello, my name is Janet Drobinski. I'm a senior legal assistant at IELTS. Previously, I worked as a certified paralegal at a Denver law firm. 
The recommendation, as written and if approved, will certainly help close the access to justice gap. However, full in-court representation is preferred for those who would otherwise stand alone in the courtroom. The anticipation of confusion across practice areas implies a lack of confidence in the legal system to know its own domain and to understand its own functioning. In 2016, IELTS launched a qualitative study of self-represented litigants in four U.S. jurisdictions, interviewing scores of judges, court administrators, and litigants to learn their perspectives. In addition to litigants, the judges, attorneys, and court staff are all hampered by low rates of representation. Our court participants observed struggles with trial preparation, evidentiary matters, and other courtroom procedures. Attorneys would prefer to encounter competent representation across the V, and there is little doubt that would improve courtroom efficiencies. Dockets are slowed when litigants show up unprepared. In a 2009 ABA survey of almost 1,000 state trial court judges, 94% of judges indicated that failure to present necessary evidence was a significant problem for those who are unrepresented. In our study, a large majority of judges and court staff commented on the issue of getting evidence before the court. One judge told us, as a general rule, if people have lawyers, we get the exhibits we need, we get a much broader range of information from which to make a decision. And so I think that people who are represented generally have better outcomes. In addition, self-represented litigant participants described feeling overwhelmed and intimidated by opposing counsel. Authorizing paraprofessionals to stand beside these desperate litigants will improve the numbers on and the quality of representation, which benefits everyone in the legal system. Our study asked if litigants might have been receptive- 15 seconds, from sorry. From an unauthorized, from an authorized non-professional, non-attorney professional. More than 85% of self-represented litigants across every jurisdiction responded favorably to this proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Lee Farron. Good morning and thank you. My name is Lee Farron. I'm an attorney at the Public Law Center, which is a legal services organization in Orange County. Um, and I just have a couple of comments today. Um, I, I, I first of all want to recognize the incredible amount of work that it was. That was a large amount of public comments to go through and I appreciate all of you taking the time to look through them. I am a little bit concerned about the way that some of them were classified. Um, for instance, there were some group comments made um, that included, you know, 15 or 20 different organizations, and that was considered just a comment from one organization. So I think that some of the statistics um, reflecting how many groups were in favor or opposing of the, the proposal is maybe not entirely an accurate reflection. Um, and I, I have a couple of comments on the uh, in-court representation and the fee cap. Um, the in-court representation is um, I think going to be very challenging. I think it's going to be very difficult to keep the proposal um, consistent across practice areas because of the different variety of hearings and the nature of the different practice areas. Apologies for the background noise. Um, and then I have um, a uh, on the fee caps. I'm a little. I'm. I'm just curious about how that proposal would be put together um, and, and when and if that would be done through regulation or through this working group or the board at a later date. Uh, thank you very much. You're muted, Linda. Thank you. And um, next is uh, Tom Gordon. Thank you. My name is Tom Gordon. I'm the executive director of Responsive Law. We're a national nonprofit organization working on behalf of consumers of legal services. Uh, we supported the initial proposal from the working group, uh, but we do take issue with some of these proposed changes. First, I'd uh, just like to uh, echo the comments of the first two commenters about in-court representation and the importance of that. Um, I also wanted to point out that in browsing the comments portal, which was wonderful work by the staff, uh, that uh, the comments have been dominated by lawyers, unsurprisingly, drowning out strong support from the rest of the public. Uh, among lawyers, uh, there is 90% opposition to the proposal compared to 6% support. But if you look at everybody else, it's 77% support to 15% opposition. Uh, in addition, there were 850 lawyers who commented and 278 non-lawyers. Um, now, the other thing that's interesting about that is that uh, lawyers are going to read about these issues in the legal press and be notified that this is something they may be interested in. Non-lawyers uh, are gonna be hard pressed to find these things. So the fact that 278 people who 
are not members of the bar decided this was worth their while and found their way here is likely representative of a much uh, greater groundswell that would be available if these were uh, more widely publicized proceedings. Um, so it's also important to note that if the working group composed primarily of lawyers takes the position backed primarily by lawyers, but overwhelmingly opposed by the rest of the public, it would be strong evidence of anti-competitive bias for its actions, which could potentially trigger antitrust liability. That aside, members of the working group should look at whether they want to do what's best for the public or what's best for a few groups of lawyers. And I think the vast majority of working group members are inclined towards the former because it's the right thing to do. Uh, I see my time is running short. I do 15 just- 15 seconds, now, thank you. Uh, that we, uh, I've sent previous uh, correspondence to the working group about fee caps, and I'm not sure what the plan is, but it, there would be hundreds of thousands of potential fee caps that would have to be created. Uh, it just seems unworkable. If we were able to lower prices by fiat, we would and would love to see lower prices for consumers, but this is simply not realistic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I don't see any additional um, raised right. hands. Um, and Judge Wiley just lost her connection and is uh, attempting to reconnect. So I'm going to uh, be turning this over, I think, right. primarily to Leah in order to start moving us forward. Um, you received the, you all received the agenda for today. You all received, of course, the, um, compilation of the hundreds and hundreds of comments. Our goal for today was to be able to queue up some, um, to hear from Leah regarding re staff recommendations on some of the big topics that received quite a bit of commentary. And so we'll go through those and hopefully take a vote on those and then talk towards the end about how to move forward, which I think will probably be one more meeting, but we can talk about that. Um, I want to preface this by saying that these are obviously recommendations from the staff. Um, my role as chair is not to vote on anything, but to make sure that we move things forward in an appropriate manner and with due consideration, which is why we spent so much time queuing up all of the information before the meeting today and moved our original meeting to today in order to give people the time to absorb the information. Um, again, these are recommendations. You all can do with them what you wish. Obviously, what we as a working group recommend to the state bar board is not necessarily what they will or will not do. They can of course then choose to make modifications as they see fit for purposes of moving things forward. Um, with that preface, I see that Judge Wiley is back with us, which is great. And Leah, would you like to take it away? Sure, you can advance the, the slide, Linda. So, um, as outlined in the, the memo posted for the meeting today, there are uh, several proposed actions or resolutions essentially for the working group to consider. Uh, the first set I have under this header of revisions. So revisions to the recommendations as they went out for public comment, uh, essentially to eliminate the ownership provision in 5.4, the uh, fee sharing provision in 1.5.1 fee sharing between paraprofessionals and attorneys um, to modify the in-court representation recommendation and to uh, develop a, a policy position on fee caps, but not a recommendation for the, spe the specifics of the fee caps themselves. So those are a, one set of proposed actions. Another is to uh, decide that we are going to exclude from consideration the host of public comments um, that fall into the categories that you see on the screen in this middle box. Those that suggested new practice areas, one that I saw uh, as I was reading through the uh, public comments was estates and trusts, for example. Um, the comments that really question whether or not the justice gap exists or um, what, what the basis is of the gap and what should be done about it. Similarly, comments that uh, suggested that there isn't a need for this type of license at all. Um, I believe that those comments should be excluded uh, from consideration by the working group. And let me let me jump in on this point because Lee and I have had a little bit of discussion about this. You know, I, I've been the one who numerous times throughout our conversation has reminded people of what is the mandate that's been given this working group. And so, for example, our mandate clearly does not include identifying whether or not there's a justice gap. You know, we were told there is a justice gap, put together the best program you can. So I, you know, my view is certainly that we should not be expanding beyond what our mandate is 
And that has to do with justice gap and need for license. And then in regards to these new practice areas, um, we can discuss it. But my personal view is at this juncture, we're not looking to expand our proposal into new practice areas. We, you know, you all have put together a proposal that is a pilot program within certain areas that contemplates reviewing how that is going and deciding if, when, and how to expand it going forward. And certainly the comments regarding practice area, I would hope would be held for, for future consideration when whoever is thinking about what else to go into can, can consider those. Um, but those just seem to be kind of, you know, clearly outside of what we should be doing at this juncture. Um, and then Leah, if you wanna move into the remaining comments. Yeah, the remaining comments, I'm not actually listed here uh, on this slide, but the recommendation is that we focus um, a review our review on those comments that contain a new in, new information or a new argument. Um, there are many, you know, thousands of comments received, and from my read of them, the vast majority um, identify issues, problems, concerns, or support uh, for the program that we heard throughout the deliberative process. And I would not characterize those as new. Uh, there are, however some issues that are raised in the comments that I do not think the group has yet considered, either because um, we ran out of time for, for, for example, the crimmigration issue uh, related to expungement work, or it just didn't necessarily come up during the course of the uh, working groups process. So I, the recommendation is that we prioritize those comments that raise uh, new issues or new arguments. And that would be for our next and hopefully final meeting. That would not be, we are not going to today be prioritizing those comments. Right. Um, so these, this is sort of repeating what I, what I just went over, but this is, these are essentially the-, the Stephen, hold on one second. Stephen Fleischman, is there something you wanted to say right now? I just would like Leah to address at some point what the overall timetable is. And We're getting there. Okay. Yeah, so you can move forward, Linda. Uh, I think these slides already covered all of this, so. All right, we can go forward and get to the timetable. So here we are today. The revised uh, recommendations need to go to the board no later than its July meeting. And as I indicated in, in the memo in, in September, that is the official sort of changing of the guard at the board. And we do need to conclude this process prior to that time. Based on the length of time it takes for this group to uh, make the necessary uh, decisions, you know, hopefully there are some decisions made today and review the remaining comments, we could either plan to present revised recommendations. This assumes there will be some revisions to your recommendations uh, to the board at its May meeting or at the latest its July meeting. So this is the time frame here. Um, and, and just so you know, the board does not have a June meeting, so it would be May or July, and July is the hard deadline. Yes. And so really, it's between now and then, that way you see April, May, one to two meetings to review and take action on the remaining comments. And I think you can pull this down now, Linda. Yeah. Carolyn? Justice Petro? Yeah, I know. I just called on Carolyn because her hand is raised but I'm not hearing her. So Stephen? Yeah, Leah, what is the plan in terms of making this proposal to the legislature? Is the plan to still do it this year or wait for the next legislative that, year? Is that up to us or is that up to the board, to the state bar to decide? And I, I will just say we've been in communication, um, you know, active communication about the program uh, since the recommendations have gone out for public comment. So I would say if this it's uh, not been form nothing's been formally submitted, but we've certainly begun the conversation. And Carolyn? Okay, so Leah, I again, we did we get that PowerPoint sent to us? The PowerPoint <laughs> has no information in it other than the just very basic um, what was already in the memo agenda that did get sent out to everyone and what we just talked about with the one two days. So no, I don't believe they sent out the PowerPoint, but I don't believe also that there's any substantive information in there that has not been distributed. 
with all due respect, Your Honor, I'd like to see it rather than fly through it because it did seem like there was different organization and there was a discussion of passing resolutions in an order that was not in the memo. So to the extent- Leah, do you want to respond to that? And if you want to put that back up? Well, I, I, I don't think we need to put it back up if you don't mind, but Linda, perhaps you can send it out. We can but send I, it out I think now. the members of the public who are on could use it again, it, it, if it's going to inform our discussions at all today. We flew through not, something that, that was- It's not going to inform our discussions. It's not containing anything substantive that's not in the posted agenda item. I don't, then why, okay. I don't know why it yeah, was shown to us then. It, in okay. case people, somebody didn't read the agenda item. Stephen, did you have something else? Your hand is still up. No, I'm sorry. It's okay. So Leah, do you want to, I mean, these are really staff recommendations. So this is for you to lead. Um, and I believe the first one was on 5.4. Yes, let's just see what, where, maybe perhaps we can see the group's reaction to that. We do have um, a draft resolution if anybody wants to make a motion uh, and then have discussion, however the group wants to proceed. I'm sorry, I just missed, what are the alternatives here? Is it not for you to present what your recommendation is and then see if someone moves, so moves or has a different motion? I don't think it's appropriate for me to um, introduce a motion. I made no, a no, no. I'm not saying okay. for you to introduce a motion. I'm saying for okay. you to explain to us what the staff recommendation is about 5.4, why okay. that is the staff recommendation, and then I will open it up and for discussion and see if there is a motion. Okay. The staff recommendation is to modify 5.4 to eliminate the provision that would allow for uh, paraprofessionals to own law firms. That's the staff recommendation. The basis for the recommendation is that this is uh, essentially a highly controversial aspect of the proposal. I don't believe that it's integral to standing up the paraprofessional program and its inclusion uh, in the program design uh, may um, have the unintended consequence of uh, really presenting a significant uh, hurdle to this getting off the ground at all. Frankly, it's just a pragmatic uh, recommendation as are all of the staff recommendations, uh, but that's the basis, that's the basis for it. Okay, and um, before we have discussion, is there anyone um, that would like to move that we modify the prior recommendation concerning 5.4? Also move. Okay, I heard more than one nay person, so, um, all right, Stephen Fleischman, I saw a hand. And then who else said something? Would, would Judge have... Wiley, I, I also moved, but I'll, I'll defer to my esteemed colleague, uh, Mr. Fleischman. Okay, so you'll second. Um, okay, now, Julia. I was just gonna make the motion. I wasn't, I was waiting to be called on, that's okay. <laughs> and Linda, did you have proposed language for that motion so that we are all on the same page? And yeah, we can make yes, sure I do. What... I can share that. And then Stephen, you can tell us if this is what you want or something different. Okay, and um, can, can is my screen being shared, Kent? Yes. yes. So, and what I did is th this, what the language on here in this resolution reflects the, what was currently um, a, a recommended. And, and, and in the only thing in red line is this, this, this one change. <sighs> Is that big enough for everyone to see? Well, no. <laughs> Do you have it on I'm your on, full screen? Yeah, well, I, I apologize, Your Honors. I'm at my parents' house. I had an emergency. <clears throat> I didn't think was gonna happen. So I'm on a, a different device. It's not a laptop. Okay. So, is, um, this, is this better? Can everyone see yes. it now? Yeah, you so again, this is the only, um, in, in terms of what I've drafted for your review, this is the only change to so what the change is to, to verbalize it. The change previously, it said that a licensed paraprofessional shall not practice in a law firm with a lawyer if the licensed paraprofessional possessed a majority ownership interest, et cetera. Now it would read a licensed paraprofessional shall not practice in a law firm with a lawyer if any licensed paraprofessional possesses any 
ownership interest or exercises controlling managerial authority in the firm. So I, I put this back to Stephen as the person making the motion to express to us if this is his intent. Yes, it is, but I'd like Greg to weigh in because I had sent Greg some suggested language, which is not here. If Greg's okay with this, I'm okay with this, but I would like to hear from him. And I think in paragraph three, that needs to be a period, not a semicolon after the word firm. Yes. Greg? I would, I did, the only thing I would add, uh, this is the first time I'm seeing this revision as well. Um, there may be other revisions to 5.4 that are necessary to be consistent with the policy decision that we're discussing right now. Um, and uh, also we need to look at rule 1.5.1 regarding sharing fees later. But um, I think the most important thing is for the group to come to a consensus that this is the policy that they wanna pursue and as I've said before, what, what the way at least I am viewing these rules, and I think the court will as well, is that their proposal is trying to capture these policy decisions. If the legislature and the court decide that this program should exist and can come to a consensus on the scope of it, um, the, the court will probably initiate a rulemaking procedure uh, where we will convene another group to actually start drafting these rules and they can be a starting point. But um, I don't have any issue with this. Stephen, I, I saw your proposal that you sent to me, which seems fine as well um, from at first blush, but I think we would have to go through a more extensive process and I don't want to get, get into actually redrafting rules on the fly here either. No, nor, nor should you yeah. be redrafting rules yeah. on the fly. So, so I, I apologize. I did not send it to Greg or to Randy in advance of the meeting, and that was my mistake. I, I apologize. With, with that clarification, Justice Petro, I'm fine with this. Well, how about we vote on the, the, the policy position, and then we right. can work between now and the next meeting with Greg and Randy and draft the actual revised rule language. I so, think that is better because I am not, I mean, I will just say as chair, I am not comfortable with revising rules on the fly like this. Um, I certainly am comfortable with, you know, and, and Stephen, you can put forward the policy position, what the change would be so that we can have discussion on that. Um, and, and maybe Linda, you could write up just one sentence or two as Stephen is talking about what is the change that we would be voting on, not the actual rule language, because if there is a change to be made, if people agree that, you know, this needs to happen, then the, um, everyone can work on the language for purpose of voting on the language on the next meeting, but we're not going to do language on the fly. So Stephen, could you please state for us what you are moving or in regards in the sense of a policy position? I move that we adopt staff's recommendation regarding rule 5.4 as stated in the March 4, 2022 memorandum. Okay, and let's give Linda a moment. Okay, and as we all know, that of course would then mean there is not, um, you know, the shared ownership and, and the other things that have been previously discussed. Carolyn. Uh, and again, I, okay. So um, here are my thoughts and I would move to table this motion. Uh, I watched the board trustees meeting uh, last week and there was one of the trustees who was very concerned about this kind of way in which to do things. Um, we wrote a very detailed report. I wrote a very detailed dissent. I'm sort of gratified that, you know, my protestations that this was included have been listened to and that people really commented on this one a lot. But um, if we're going to make this change, and this applies to the rest of the changes as well, the fee cap proposal says there's not been enough time to discuss this. And I actually take to heart the comment that we had today. Uh, from people that said, you might not be able to stand this up. Um, so we're going to turn into yet again another set of problems by making these, these four changes. 
So I'm really either going to vote no or abstain. I haven't really designed, design, um, decided which. I, I really um, feel for what that trustee member said. We have a report. Um, if we're going to change it, we should see the change. And um, the staff recommendation is vague. So let's see the rule. We had we had a draft rule um, provided. Um, it was altered. Let's get it. Let's get it right. Let's see what the very detailed regulations that were prepared are going to say. How that impact is. And I don't like the idea of passing this off to yet another committee. Um, so I could go on. So this is not uh, to be clear. Um, I don't believe there's any intent to pass it off to another committee. Um, I believe. Oh. It would be the next meeting you'd get a rule proposal. This is a vote on the policy position to advance this uh, this view, right? So that then the next step is to draft the rule language that you would then vote on at the next meeting. Right, to implement okay, but it. The, Linda, the I'm sorry, just one, second, just one second, Carolyn. Linda, it says March 4, 2020. Shouldn't it be 2022? <coughs> Carolyn? Okay. The policy provisions that we're talking about in the memo on page two says, um, this is best left for consideration by other state bar working groups or task forces. So we're leapfrogging this. We should, you know, if you're gonna limit, if you're gonna adapt a policy, let's put the policy in um, as it's stated verbatim, otherwise was, we're amending it. So I'm-, that, I'm was in, that, that was intended, Carolyn, to reference the fact that the issue of non-attorney ownership itself which was reflected in the working group's original uh, 5.4 recommendation is a big issue. Obviously, it's extremely controversial that there is another state bar working group that is going to have to deal with it. They can't stand up this regulatory sandbox without it. So that's simply saying if there are going to be any changes to 5.4, that group can deal with it. We're essentially re reverting to 5.4 status quo. So we're not changing 5.4. The original working group recommendations did. Now there's a proposal to claw that back and leave 5.4 as it is. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take my motion to the table off. And I'm still troubled by the fact that we get these re res resolutions, we support them, we get them on the fly. And then we have okay, to I want to be very, I, I appreciate that. And that's why I don't want to do the language on the fly, but I want to say, and I want to compliment staff for this because they have worked extremely hard. And this proposal was sent out with plenty of time for folks on the working group to consider it and think about it. Um, Ira? Uh, I do have a substantive comment, but uh, I guess this is the time for that, maybe not. All right, yes. uh, but before that, I think uh, for, for the benefit of the uh, public uh, audience, we ought to put in here uh, what we're seeing on the screen that um, uh, after the word memorandum, um, let's see, well, our new sentence maybe, uh, the, uh, the effect no, I, I completely agree with you, Ira. I think it yeah. would be much better to have this up here to say, what is that? Rather than just saying as stated in the March 4th memorandum, put yeah. in what it actually says. Well, the effect is to uh, eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to co-own law firms. That's not precisely what it says, but I, I think it's, it's what it means. It's lawyers. Yeah, it says eliminate the ability oh, uh, of lawyers and paraprofessionals to co-own law firms. Yeah, but <laughs> lawyers can always co-own law firms. Um, it, lawyers I, and paraprofessionals together. I understand that, but I don't think. It, right. Well, Ira, I think what they're what we're saying we're we're not eliminating the ability of paraprofessionals to own law firms together, amongst themselves. I mean, a group is not considering that unless I miss something. I don't, but to me, it means eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to own law firms or co-own law firms. It's the same well, thing. Well, anyway, I, I don't think it matters. Any of these formulations is fine. I, I think I understand. I think uh, maybe we're talking at cross purpose. In, in terms of law firms, and I know Stephen ha has a strong position on this, that law firms are really uh, firms owned by lawyers. And yeah. that we should call these firms something else. 
So can uh, I go back? Can I go back to Stephen for one second? The way it currently reads is um, hold on, because there's editing is still happening here. Resolve that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group adopts the staff recommendation regarding Rule 5.4 4 to eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to have an ownership interest in a law firm that includes lawyers. And so, Stephen. I accept Ira's modification. I, I won't take credit for that. <laughs> I uh, say, but, but I agree that's what it should say. And, you know, we've obviously had a lot of conversation <clears throat> about 5.4 and it generated a lot of really interesting um, comments, which I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, Leah, was, before we hear more or before, you know, I invite more people to comment on this, is there anything you want to tell us about why this is the staff recommendation? Not that I haven't already know. Okay. Well, so- can I, can I make my substantive comment? Yes. All right. I'm very much against this. Um, uh, Leah has uh, said, in, uh, and it says in the staff recommendation, that um, the reason for it is, is essentially that we don't think that the, uh, there's support among the public or, uh, or the legislature or whoever is going to decide on this to pass our program, uh, the paraprofessional program, uh, if professionals are allowed to co-own uh, firms with lawyers. All right, now that's a practical reason, but I think we was candid and has been, and everybody has been that, that it's, even if we disagree, that it's a practical reason in order to get the program passed. All right, but I'm still very much against it. As far as the practical reason, if we think that, and we have voted, that paraprofessionals should be allowed to co-own law firms with lawyers. We should stick with that. And if it's, if the, but it, it's not up to us. I, this is a recommendation to the board of trustees. And if the board of trustees don't like it, they will not, ex they'll, they'll pass a program without it. But we've had lots of discussion and, and came to the conclusion that they should be allowed to co-own. Secondly, um, what's the reason, what's the reason that non-lawyers in general cannot own law firms? Well, they're not subject to the uh, professional uh, rule, the rules of professional conduct and, and other rules that lawyers have to abide by to protect clients. Paraprofessionals will be subject to those exact same rules. They're, they're so there's no good reason that pair, no good, yes, there's no good reason that paraprofessionals should not be able to co-own lawyers. And I think the, the, what's underlying all this is a feeling among lawyers that they don't want their stuff <laughs> um, uh, shared with uh, people who are not lawyers. Um, uh, or their fees shared with people who are not lawyers. Well, the whole idea of this program is that yes, lawyers stuff, if you will, is going to be shared by paraprofessionals. They're, the whole purpose of this program is to allow a limited practice of law by paraprofessionals. They are, as I say, they're subject to the same ethics rules, the same lawyer uh, client protection rules, and therefore, there's no reason to prohibit them from having ownership or, or control of law firms. That's it. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And, um, uh, Stephen Fleischman. Yeah, I was hoping to avoid substantive debate on this, so I'll try to be quick. We sent our proposal out for public comment. The Attorney General of the State of California, who's the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the state, he has no dog in this hunt about lawyer ownership. He says it's a bad idea. One of the letters I attached to my memo for today's meeting was from Lori Zelon, 
And if anyone doesn't know Justice Zelon, she sat on the Court of Appeal in LA for more than 20 years. She has received every pro bono public service award known to mankind. I don't know anybody in the state more dedicated towards access to justice issues. And she says it's, this is a bad idea. You know, we have the Stone Umberg letter from the legislature saying non lawyer ownership is a bad idea. And, you know, Erica always compliments me on my good memory, but my recollection is when we voted on this the first time around, Ira was with me voting against the 5.4 proposal. So I would just oh, urge what? everyone to. Pardon me, my name has just been used. It, I can change my mind. Yes, you can. So I'd urge everyone to vote in favor of this resolution and accept the staff's recommendation. Carolyn? Oh, I thought maybe there were other people. I, I do like how more, much more specific this is. So yeah, I think I'm going to change my mind as well and vote for it. Okay. Um, is there any other, and I apologize if I'm not seeing a hand, if I'm trying to scroll because I have you all on the side since we have. Um... Okay, I do not see, I'm sorry, did I just hear a voice? Uh, Monica Wiley, Justice Petro, if there is no further discussion, uh, then I'm happy to second the resolution. Okay, super, thank you very much, Judge Wiley. And I am not seeing any further discussion, which I mean think means that Linda, we should call this for a vote. Okay. Um, Bashan? Yes. Reynoldson? Yes. Falmouth? No. Um, Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Uh, Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? No. McRae? Yes. Olvera? No. Uh, Robinson? Yes. Shining? Yes. Sarouche? Yes. Spiro? No. Um, uh, Judge Wiley? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Okay, so we can go. Do you want to, I think, Amos? So, um, on Leon 1.5.1, 1. um, I'm sorry, Amos, you have your hand up. Yeah, before we move on to a different rule, I think there might be another policy question for 5.4. Okay. that we may or may not want to discuss because ownership of law firms is only a part of rule 5.4. Um, you know, how lawyers and paraprofessionals are able to work together, I think is foundational. Ownership of law firms, I agree, is not foundational, but how lawyers and paraprofessionals, whether they're in separate firms or in the same firm, are able to work together I think is foundational. And, you know, we could come up with this, we could have this discussion in connection with 1.5.4. That would be when they're in different firms. I think the question is still open as to uh, lawyers and paraprofessionals that work at the same firm where there's not common ownership. So in other words, no paraprofessionals own the firms. Uh, you know, what can the relationship be? Can they be billed out on the same bill to clients, a paraprofessional and a lawyer? Can there, do they need to have separate engagement letters? All those things I think may implicate 5.4 as well as the ownership interest. So it might be something to take up now or um, you know, we'll, we'll end up, I think, talking about that at the next meeting. Um, Stephen Fleischman. Yeah, Amos, the language I sent to Greg on 5.4 has language that a paraprofessional may be employed by a law firm. I would suggest that we just let Greg do his thing um, and discuss these issues at the next meeting. I just don't see us reaching consensus on those type of issues today. But I, I agree with you conceptually, we need to say what they can do within a law firm and address the retainer agreement issue. 
Can I just ask why we didn't need to do that before? Because just because lawyers and paraprofessionals could uh, own a firm together under the prior version of our Rule 5.4, it didn't mandate that they must, meaning they could have had a, re a relationship where a lawyer employed a paraprofessional, and we didn't address the issues you're it raising. Was, it, it was pointed out to me by ethics experts on the LA County Bar Professional Responsibility and Ethics Committee that they felt there was a huge hole in, the, in what we proposed in that we have all these mandatory disclosure obligations in 1.4 and elsewhere, and it was unclear to them whether a paraprofessional working in a law firm would the law firm retainer agreement have to include that language. If so, law firms might be reluctant to hire paraprofessionals um, as opposed to if a paraprofessional is working on their own, clearly those disclosures would need to be made. And I thought there was uncertainty in that area. Although surprisingly, I didn't see public comments bringing that up, but that's my answer to your question, Leah. Okay. If um, I could, if yes. I could just comment very briefly, and and again, I don't know if this is the right time, but uh, to put a finer point on it, uh, there are a lot of rules of professional conduct that might be implicated by this. Um, so so, and it has to do with fee sharing and fee splitting, which is related to but different than ownership of a firm that has attorneys and paraprofessionals. So I just. One way or another, we're going to have to revise the rules consistent with the policy decision that was just made. And I think there's well, additional policy decisions about how lawyers and care professionals could work together. And I think we need to also, when we go back to this, take a look at, you know, whether what was raised in public comment. Um, because I do think what we're trying to do right now is be responsive to that. Um, I, I'm not saying we did put together a proposal. Uh, I am just cognizant of while wanting to do this in an intelligent manner, not doing new things that we don't necessarily have to do. I'm not saying that we, I'm not saying that I have an opinion on this one, one way or the other. I do think that obviously we're going to see the exact language that we're dealing with in regards to 5.4. Um, but let's also try to keep in mind that what actually came back to us in public comment at this juncture. Uh, Julia? Um, I was going to suggest that um, in the next resolution, which is B under number one in the executive summary, where it says eliminate the ability of lawyers and paraprofessionals to share fees, it could be there that we clarify that they can be employed by a law firm, but they cannot share the attorney fee. So with the vision that they're gonna be treated just like a paralegal that would be hired by a law firm or an associate attorney. They can have a salary, but normally you're not sharing a, a, a fee with an associate attorney and you can't share a fee with a paralegal. So I think we could take care of uh, this clarification that Amos has raised and put it with the next resolution. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, anyone else at this point on this? Okay, so Leah, 1.5.1, um, and likewise, if you could please let us know what exactly the staff recommendation is here. But the staff recommendation is to eliminate the ability of lawyers and paraprofessionals to share fees. The rationale for the recommendation is similar to that for 5.4. Okay. And, and likewise, are you recommending that um, any exact language would be vetted by Greg at all and you'd have that to us well in advance of the next meeting? Yes. All right, is there anyone that would like to uh, so move? So if move. We, all right. Can we hear from Greg first? Well, we're going to hear from Greg, but um, there's a motion from Stephen Fleischman, second, I believe from Sharon, is that correct? That's correct. All right, Greg. I would just recommend um, to the point, a, a couple comments already, including from Juliet. Um, 
I would just eliminate from this motion a reference to that specific rule because I think it does affect a lot of rules. Um, under the lawyer rules, rule 5.4a, an exception to lawyers sharing fees with non-lawyers is that they can um, uh, share with non-lawyers employed in their firm if it's a compensation or retirement plan. Um, and that's what that gets to what we were talking about before. If it, a prayer professional is, is an employee of a law firm, um, they are able to participate in a, a compensation plan or a retirement plan. And that is one of, of five exceptions, now I guess six exceptions to um, the absolute prohibition, which is not absolute, <laughs> um, to share, lawyers sharing fees with non-lawyers. So I would just say, um, it, 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 in one of the revisions we would probably have to do to Rule 1.5.1 is subject to Rule 5.4a, uh, lawyers and, and paraprofessionals cannot share fees or divide fees. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Greg. And so, Stephen, do you accept the amendment so that this simply reads on the policy issue that the working group adopts the staff recommendation to eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to share fees with lawyers? Yes, gladly. And Sharon, do you agree with that as well? I do agree. Okay. So with that um, modification, would anyone like to be her? Hold on one second. I'm just doing my usual scrolling on the side here. Um, Amos and then Julia and then Ira. Thank you. So I just want to make it clear, and, and I think maybe Greg did just make it clear, but um, you know, usually 1.5.1 is related to people working in different firms and 5.4 mostly is when they're working in the same firm. So we are mixing concepts that weren't mixed in the staff recommendations. Uh, I think that's okay if we're going on a policy, but I think it's not just attorney's fees we're talking about, we're talking about paraprofessional fees, which are also legal fees. So the question is, can a paraprofessional, a related question is how paraprofessionals can work together with other paraprofessionals and how paraprofessionals and attorneys can work together. And that's further divided by in the same firm or in a different firm. So I just think these are, there's, I think we're now mixing the concepts of five, one, this, this vote now is not just about 1.5.1, but it's talking about both when people are working independently at different firms and together at the same firm. And I just want to make sure that's clear. And Greg, do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Um, that rule 1.5.1 for lawyers is written in that way that as Amos alluded, it, it regulates lawyers working in different firms and the extent to which they can divide a fee. So um, the, what we're talking about now is changing the character of that rule for paraprofessionals and, and broadening it, which is going to have implications for rule 5.4, which is what I was trying to allude to. The alternative is that we just say that paraprofessionals cannot share uh, fees with other paraprofessionals or lawyers not working in the same firm, and then let 5.4 do its work um, in, in terms of people working within the same firm. But this starts to get complex, and this is one of the reasons we don't want to really try to revise on the fly. Right. Um, Julia? So to clarify, would it be helpful, uh, Stephen Fleshman, if we said to eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to share fees with lawyers, whether they are working in the same law firm or otherwise? I gladly accept that amendment. Sharon? Or maybe just whether or not in the same law firm. Okay. I think it's very close to what you proposed in the email to me, uh, Stephen. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense to me too. Okay. Um, Ira? All right. Uh, I am against this one too. Um, one of the reasons is the same as why I was against the, the first one, that we took a long time and decided we would allow fee sharing to some extent. And 
we're the purpose of this resolution here is because there we perceive there isn't enough support to get the program passed with the fee sharing. As I said before, we should stick to our guns. And if the Board of Trustees this is a recommendation to them, if the Board of Trustees doesn't like it, they will reject the fee share. Um, now, on this kind of substantively, if you will, I've, I've had, had a lot of trouble thinking about um, the pros and cons of fee sharing and why fee sharing is prohibited. I, I've done some reading. I, I found an, a, a, a very interesting law review even this morning and read it. And uh, frankly, I don't see any good reason for um, uh, the prohibition on fee sharing, at least with regard to paralegals. Let me read something from this. This is an article from Southwestern Law Review. Uh, it's from 92. Um, fee splitting between lawyers and non-lawyers is seen by courts and disciplinary boards as more serious than fee splitting between lawyers. This is due to reasoning. One, the lawyer's independent judgment will be compromised by the desire to please the non-lawyer who's getting a fee share who might have referred the case. Number two, the lawyer is assisting the non-lawyer in the unauthorized practice of law. No, all right, let's take number one. I'm trying not to be too long with this. Uh, number one, uh, the lawyer's independent judgment, the lawyer sharing fees uh, with somebody else, with a non-lawyer is gonna be compromised. That is no good reason. It does, it's not even true that we already have, we already allow California lawyers to share fees with lawyers who are not admitted in the, to the California bar. That's part of the ethics rules. And, uh, and we're not worried about those. Those people are not authorized to practice law in California, but still the state bar uh, has decided that it's okay. So they're not worried about those non-lawyers influencing uh, the independent judgment of the lawyer who's sharing their fees. We have our pair of professionals, as, as we all know, in this program will be subject to the same ethics rules as California lawyers. And so there's no reason uh, that, that we need to be worried about the paraprofessionals, licensed paraprofessionals who can get, lose their license for, for violating their ethics rules. We don't have any reason to, to think that they're going to compromise the independent judgment of the lawyer and any of the lawyer. Secondly, uh, the rationale of the courts and the bars associations, uh, regulatory associations has been, according to this article, the lawyer assisting the non-lawyer, the lawyer assist, will assist the non-lawyer in the practice of, in the unauthorized practice of law. Once again, the out-of-state lawyers, if they practice law in a California case, that's the unauthorized practice of law. And we're not concerned about that, are we? Secondly, what, what, I do not see how the non-lawyer who gets the paraprofessional, who gets part of the fee, that's going to mean that they're going to be practicing law. As a matter of fact, they are, they are allowed to practice law in, in their limited extent. And secondly, how does their getting of a fee mean that they're going to be practicing law beyond their licensure? That makes no sense to me. I don't see how that follows. Um, all right, thank you. Um, Amos? Thank you, and I apologize, I might be a little bit still in the weeds on this. We spent a lot of time on the regulation subcommittee going through these rules and their implications. I just want to make sure uh, it's clear to the full working group what this means practically. Uh, I was planning on voting in favor of the staff recommendations in the memo, but this is a significant change to that. So I just wanna make sure it's clear. For the rule 5.4, we focused on ownership of law firms, but I think the consensus is still 
paraprofessionals should be able to work with lawyers in law firms. Um, this, when it was- uh, Can I ask you just, Amos, can I ask you to hold on one second? Leah, I need you to chime in whether, to let us know whether in fact this is the staff recommendation or is different from it, because I want there to be clarity about what you're recommending or not, which is not to say that that's what we have to vote on, but I just want that to be clear. Well, it's a little well, bit in the weeds. Do you mind if I explain why it's different than what was in the memo? Okay, and but then at some point I need Leah to, as the person putting forth the recommendation, we, we do need to hear from her as to what the recommendation is. Right, so uh, again, as I was explaining earlier, rule 1.5.1 .1 deals with the situation where attorneys and paraprofessionals are working in different firms and how they can split fees. So if the recommendation is related to, is limited to rule 1.5.1, we're talking about, um, you know, if, if a paraprofessional in one firm wants to work with an attorney in another firm, they're gonna have to have separate engagement letters and separate bills. They're not able to combine onto a single bill and bill the, bill the client once and, and split the fees. That's what 1.5.1 deals with. I think this, and I would vote in favor of the staff recommendation for 1.5.1, which is to eliminate the ability of lawyers and paraprofessionals to share fees when they're at different firms. By combining the concepts here, you're going beyond rule 1.5.1 and also covering this, the situation when they're working at the same firm, which is a 5.4 issue currently. And what this in practice would mean that even paraprofessionals and attorneys working at the same firm would have to have separate engagement letters and would have to have separate bills to clients and would not be able to commingle those funds because paraprofessionals are doing legal work too and getting legal fees and attorneys are doing legal work and getting legal fees. And what we're saying is those are separate and cannot be split, shared, commingled. I think is what is being proposed on this. And I, I don't think that's the intent or that was not my reading of the staff proposal, which I would have voted in favor of if it's limited to uh, eliminating the ability of lawyers and paraprofessionals to share fees when they're at different firms. So the, the, the latter was the staff recommendation. I'm sorry, just to be really not, clear, Leah, rather than saying latter, just tell us what exactly was the staff recommendation. To eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals and lawyers to share fees when they're in different firms. However, based on the last conversation we had when we were discussing 5.4, the need to expand it to include um, paraprofessional and lawyer arrangements when they're in the same firm, what is written on the screen now is my understanding of where the group wants to go. So yes, it's accurate that this is different from the staff recommendation, but I am understanding this to be the motion on the table based on the direction that the working group is going. So. And that might be right. I just wanted to make that clear that I think I would have voted in favor of the staff proposal to, to limit fee splitting between attorneys and paraprofessionals at different firms, which is a 1.5.1 issue. I think the practical difference here is significant because I think it will really change and might eliminate the, the realistic possibility that paraprofessionals and attorneys can work together in the same firm. Julia? And you're muted. I think we can address this in our discussion with fee caps. It, assuming we vote in favor of fee caps, uh, I mean, I understand that there may be some more procedural requirements that have to be adhered to if we're not quote unquote fee sharing. But if there is a fee cap on particular services, then we know what the, what, what is in the realm of what can be paid to the paraprofessional. If they have to have a separate fee agreement or cannot commingle funds, I don't see that as being very problematic. That's part of running a law firm. So, and, and, and if they have to wait to be paid that fee coming with a fee cap following their work, fine, but I, I don't believe that the accounting 
or the not commingling of funds should be that difficult for an attorney to adhere to. And if it only requires a second uh, retainer agreement, that paperwork is not that complicated. But I think the fact that we're going to be taking up the issue of fee caps, that is more of a, uh, the real argument is we do will have predictability about what those paraprofessionals will be paid. Stephen Fleischman. Yeah, I just wanted to say two things. Amos, I get what you're saying, but I think that's addressed by the last clause. And so, you know, if we want to eliminate the last clause and go back to adopting staff recommendation, I can live with that. I think it was Julie, Julia's recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, and then Linda, as you have it on the screen, I think we're missing a verb since you deleted adopts. Maybe just votes to eliminate, um, or or recommend. So, but the, are, before I finalize it, are we going to go back to the original right. recommendation about five point one before I modify this any further? I think. Leah, are you okay going back to the original to get Amos on board? Yes. If Julie is fine with it, I am too. So if it's the original recommendation, I think it should be rule 1.5.1. Yes. And it should be, I think for clarity, to eliminate the ability of paraprofessionals to share fees with lawyers working at different firms. Fine. Um, so well, that, we're then we're chat and we're, like, from attendees, I think we need to turn off the chat function. I was going to ask for that. I'm I'm getting confused who these people are, so I I would appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure um, how to do that. I think you just go into your settings and you disable. Yeah. I guess then the only thing that I'm uh, still then have unanswered for me is the question of that Amos raised to the previous resolution. Are we going to make a statement that they can share fees while being employed by a law firm? Or are we going to take that up with fee caps that they cannot be paid more than the fee cap would allow? So I understand as an employee, they may have one of those exceptions. So I could vote for this, but I, I, I do think the earlier uh, issue that Amos ra uh, raised was clarity about them being employed by a law firm, uh, including Greg's idea of what the exceptions are to sharing fees when they have to do a different things. And I guess that can just be taken care of with the writing. So if, if everybody's comfortable with that, I'll, I'll leave it up to our experts on writing this. <laughs> um, Steven? I'm sorry, I, I meant to lower my hand, but okay. I'm fine with what Julia said. Okay. Um, I'm just taking a moment to see if anyone else is raising a hand here, a virtual hand. Oh, Elizabeth. Um, so I just wanted to um, make a comment for what it's worth. Um, when we're talking about sharing fees from the paraprofessional to the lawyer, I mean, how much fees do you guys really think we're talking about? In the um, 2019 Justice Gap report, it said that, you know, low to moderate income wage earners that are representing themselves, you know, in court, do not have the funds to pay fees sometimes to any professional, whether it be to a paraprofessional or to a lawyer. Um, one of, but I do see where one of the benefits, and of, of course, this has been discussed thoroughly by the subcommittees, and you guys have done a great job, but I just wanted to balance out with my comments, you know, just what's, you know, being discussed here. 
Um, one of the benefits of allowing this fee sharing is it enhances cooperation between attorneys and paraprofessionals to um, you know, increase access to justice and um, two minds are greater than one. And when these people cooperate, then the, consu the consumer wins. Um, and we, and I know that attorneys do not lift a finger unless there is some money involved um, and that they're going to get a piece of the action, so sort of say. But um, the reason why I would vote that this fee sharing be allowed is because um, it would serve the client at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other hands. Um, so Linda, would you like to take the vote then? Linda. Yes, I will do so. Um, okay, uh, Bashan? Yes. Brynelson? Yes. Salma? No. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Edge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Erfmeyer? No. McRae? Yes. Olvera? No. Uh, yeah, you can have it. I, I need a three. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, you should be able to have it for a while. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I yeah, was we trying to figure out someone. how to. Yeah. Okay, so Linda, where were you? Um, Robinson. Oh, you can toss that paper I have. Uh, oh. Okay, who, do we know who we're hearing speaking? Yeah, yeah, yes, Tom Gordon. Tom Gordon, Gordon, and he's yeah. not a member, is he? No. So why are we hearing this? I'm not sure. It says Tom Gordon talking permitted. So can you please change that, Linda? Yes, hold on a second. Sorry. I think that's when he was making public comment. Right, but yeah, right. maybe he turned off. Um, okay. I, let's see. I don't see him. Now it's, look at him at, yeah. now it's changed. So Linda, you okay, can go good. back to taking the vote. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Robinson. Yes. Shining. Yes. Sarush. Yes. Spiro. No. Um, Judge Wiley. Yes. Um, okay. And the motion carries. Hey. Um, Leah, I, I would ask you to go out of order since we've been talking about fees. It seems to me to make more sense to have the next topic be the fee cap one rather than switching to in court representation and then going back to fee caps. Okay. So the recommendation here is to adopt a policy position around the need for fee caps, um, but not to try to develop the fee caps themselves. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, as much as I have tried to uh, grapple with how you would actually establish a reasonable fee cap, I have been unable to figure out a way uh, to do it. Uh, that will be fair and will ensure um, kind of a reasonable standard of living and the appropriate incentive structure for the paraprofessional. That being said, I believe that the lack of fee caps is a major obstacle to getting this program off the ground. This is another recommendation of mine that is pragmatic not based on my own personal views. So uh, I, I say that to say there, there was an interesting comment that was included um, that suggested that caps be set as a percentage of uh, the attorney hourly rates in the area. Now, there are many, many reasons why that would be very difficult to implement, but that kind of a cap to me is more appropriate than one that is a per case or per event rate because I'm very concerned about the incentive structures in per case or per event paradigms. Um, I think they incentivize churning of cases. So that's why I am saying, let's uh, establish a position that there should be fee caps, but not try to get into the very complicated and challenging process of setting those caps. And 
one of the public commenters asked, you know, how would how would they be set? I think this would be set legislatively. That's the process. I think that's the entity that thinks this is important. And that is the entity that could establish the cap. So again, a practical uh, proposal, uh, not necessarily based on my own uh, policy views. Greg? I would, I would agree with that. I, this seems more of a legislative issue than a, an issue for the court. The way in which it would inter interact with the rules of professional conduct is that rule 1.5 prohibits now attorneys from charging an unconscionable or illegal fee. So to the extent a, uh, an attorney um, charges more uh, of a contingency fee than is permitted uh, under statute in workers comp cases or micro cases, they may be subject to discipline because they violated that, that law. But I agree with Leah, this also goes to, um, it seems to me more squarely within the, the police power of the legislature to impose a fee cap if it chooses to. And it, it's just more of a policy decision than um, a regulation of the legal profession per se. And Stephen? Yeah, I agree with what Leah and Greg just said. This is inherently a legislative matter. I think all we need to do is say we recommend the legislature adopt fee caps. What I would add to that is I thought staff did a remarkable job gathering and putting together, if I recall, it was a 69-page report. And I think whatever our final report is should reference that report, and we should add it as an exhibit because there was a tremendous amount of helpful information in there. Kimberly. And I'm sorry, I don't remember this, but Leah, what did any of the other entities that have started a paraprofessional program, were there fee caps in any of those other programs? No, not that I'm aware of. That's something um, that we could check, but not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. There are, are some in the sense that there are some programs that where they don't actually allow the paraprofessionals to charge anything, that's where they're required to be employed um, by another entity, but not um, sort of a free market fee cap or individual independent paraprofessional fee cap. But I could look into that, Kim. Is there any other comment? It seems like Linda is not currently online. I, is that correct? No, I'm here. Oh, okay. Because I thought I saw that the ownership of the meeting was changed. I did that, that just so that so that uh, someone else could work with the settings. And okay. Um, all right. So, uh, any uh, any other comments or thoughts about this proposal to put in place the recommendation that there be fee caps? You know, TBD. Obviously, aside from conversations we've had. Um, Amos and then and then Julie, please. So I, I support this. Um, I think the language that we put up uh, or vote on is important because I, I think I hear two different versions of this. So um, let's one, get that up. Let's get that language up while we're talking yeah. and make sure that, that uh, the person moving actually is moving what it says. Right, one, one I think is that the this working group continue to work on what that can and should look like, fee caps or fee regulation can and should look like. And the other, which was I think just discussed was this is a punt to the legislative branch saying there should be fee caps, but we're not going to yeah. weigh in on what that looks like. So I think which I, of those we <clears throat> choose is very, is I think those are very different. Exactly. Um, I didn't hear anyone putting in, I mean, I see here factors to be considered. I did not understand that to be part of the motion to include factors. Maybe I missed it. No, and this was just a draft that I had to start with um, to work on. Cause I don't think there's actually been a motion yet, has there? Okay, is there someone so who would like- just, This was something to start a, a starting basis for the group to discuss. Okay, is there someone who would like to make a motion? Stephen, what motion would you like to make? Resolve that the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group recommends that the <laughs> legislature Adopt fee cap. Hold on one second. Let, let's let Linda. For services provided by paraprofessionals. Period. End of story. 
So it currently reads resolved that the group recommends that the legislature adopt fee caps for services provided by paraprofessionals, mm -hmm. period, full stop. That's your intent um, as far as what the motion should say? Yes. All I right. mean, I'm open to amendments, but yeah. No, I, I understand that. Um, is there a second? Can we hear from Julie first? Sure, go ahead. Um, thank you, Justice Petro. Uh, I, I oppose the concept of fee caps for the reasons that we all discussed at three meetings of this working group, March, 2021, again in May, and again in, we discussed it again in August in the context of contingency fees. We noted that the vast majority of attorneys are subject to no fee caps at all. Certain types of practice are subject to a fee cap, but those are a small percentage of overall attorney practice. And I believe it's unfair to subject paraprofessionals to a restriction to which most attorneys are not subject. I was also persuaded at several of those meetings by written comment from Responsive Law and the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession that these fee caps would be extremely difficult. Their word was unmanageable uh, to establish either by this working group or the State Bar Board of Trustees or legislature. A fee cap that is appropriate in Judge Harper's County would be completely inappropriate in Los Angeles County. Um, I, they also persuasively argued what to me is the elephant in the room. The market will take care of this issue. That is likely why the vast majority of attorney practice is subject to no fee caps. Um, I, I think it's um, important to note that we did consider this issue on at least three occasions. We did not take it lightly. And um, I, would, uh, I would vote to impose the same general rule on paraprofessionals as, as applies to most attorneys, which is no fee caps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fariba? Thank you. Um, so I oppose this at this point, because we haven't really gotten to the in-court representation piece yet. I previously opposed it to my position is that we are uh, allowing our professionals to do exactly the same, um, to perform exactly the same task as attorneys in, in most areas, especially in family law, but we are trying to impose this artificial, uh, these fee caps to artificially keep their fees low and create um, access to justice. It's not fair um, because we don't impose it on the attorney who's representing someone on the other side doing exactly the same thing. And I always bring up this example, modification of child support. They can do in-court representation. They can give legal advice. They can run child support calculations. They can do meet and confer and ultimately they can litigate but we want them to charge us. What's the point there? Mm -hmm. Now we have eliminated uh, fee sharing. We have eliminated ability to uh, co-own firms, which I support, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I, would wanna, I would wanna see what happens with in-court representation before I support fee caps for the reasons I've just explained. Thank you. Okay. Um, Julie, did you wish to make further comments? Oh, no, I'm so, no, I'm sorry. That's OK. And Fariba, if you could take your hand down as well, that would be great. Um, Amos, we'll go back to you and then Stephen. OK, thank you. So I just wanted, again, to say that I would have voted in favor of the staff recommendations. I think I will make a alternate motion uh, for the staff recommendations. And I think the main difference is who's doing the work or the next work, because I, I, I with policy, a, a policy decision that there should be fee caps and fee regulation, I think it's appropriate to make to say that we're not going to look at the parameters of what that should look like, uh, how it could be implemented, make recommendations about what it looks like. I think that's a mistake. I do think that falls. Um, I think there's a question that I would like to pose to Leah, which is how long does our group exist? Because my understanding was that we were uh, configured to present the proposal to the state bar, take, you know, and obviously also to take the comments and modify the proposal. And then I thought that at that juncture, um, we were essentially disbanded and that if there were further working groups needed, they would be put together. Um, Leah, what is, what's gone on? Uh, well, the working group certainly is not gonna exist past the 
submission of its final recommendations, which per uh, the timeline we went over earlier would be at the May or July meeting. I, I do not believe that we are going to be able as a group to come up with fee caps. Um, I, I also believe it is um, appropriately a political process uh, that is not one for this group to undertake. Um, so that that's you know what I would say. I, I think in the memo, I talked about perhaps developing policy parameters, um, which this motion does not you know, suggest that we would, and I'm fine with this motion. Um, I think if, if the group wanted to engage in a conversation about parameters for fee caps, that might be workable within the time frame that we have, but not a fully articulated uh, fee cap structure. Stephen and then Ira. Yeah, procedurally, Justice Petro, I'm fine with Fariba's suggestion if you wanna flip the order and talk about in-court representation. But substantively, I would just say to, to Fariba and Julia that you know all we're doing is making a recommendation to the legislature to do it. That doesn't mean the legislature is going to do it. They will engage in the legislative process and they may or may not at the end of the day adopt the fee caps. I think what Leia, the reason Leia is recommending it is to get this approval we're increasing the chances of getting this through by adopting this recommendation. Correct. And as we've noted before, whatever we recommend or not is not necessarily what the state bar is going to have in its proposal or not. So for example, the working group could pass this resolution and then that might not be part of what the um, state bar moves forward. Likewise, the working group could decide not to pass this and stick with its original recommendation. And then the state bar could decide to include fee caps. So I just want to, because sometimes our conversation, it sounds like we're making the decisions. We're not. We're doing the recommendation. The state bar will then um, make the proposal. Ira and then Kimberly. Uh, I'd like to uh, float the idea of uh, our resolution asking or proposing that the state bar appoint a committee or working group, whatever you want to call it, to um, uh, propose uh, specific fee caps, as opposed to uh, simply asking the legislature or recommending that the legislature do it. Kimberly? Well, I appreciate um, where Lee is coming from with the recommendation and the staff's recommendation with stating that, you know, this will help the, it get through. If we are leaving it up to the legislature, that's their ability right now. And as Julie said, we have decided this and discussed it at three meetings. So I don't know why we have to change our current stance because the legislature can do whatever they want anyway when they see this and they'll have everybody speaking to them as well. And they can at that time impose beef caps if they believe that that's warranted um, themselves. I'm not sure. Um, that this would change their opinion one way or the other. Um, Ira, were you done with your comments or no? Um, well, uh, that, there's one other. I, sure. I want to say thank you. I, I, I thought I actually was, <laughs> but I had another thought, which was that um, I think it's much more likely that the the state bar working group, a new one, would actually do the work of uh, formulating fee caps as opposed to the legislature. Amos? Yeah, I agree. And I also think the court has uh, authority to do that too, even though it's not typically done. There are certainly situations currently, especially where attorneys are appointed by courts where there are fee schedules and fee caps uh, currently. So I, I don't think we should pre-judge who does this. I think I would like to make an alternate motion. I don't think there was a second to this motion. I'd like to make an alternate motion that uh, fee caps or regulation should be part of a paraprofessional program. Hope, so don't, don't erase anything yet, please. Linda, don't erase anything yet. Let me hear what Amos has to say. Sorry, go ahead, Amos. Fee caps for fee caps or regulation should be part of a paraprofessional program to ensure that in this part I'm taking directly from the memo, 
paraprofessional services are at a lower cost than those of attorneys and should be affordable to middle-class Californians. Let's give Linda a moment here. So I'm not quite clear, and I'll ask uh, Lee as well, since this was part of the proposal, what, what fee caps or regulations means. <laughs> well, I, I don't as opposed to just saying that fee caps be part of the program, and then they can figure out how to do those. I don't know. That's not my language. So um, can I just clarify, first of all, on the language on the screen, it's are at a lower cost than those of attorneys? Sorry, are at a lower cost. Yeah, so um, the reason I my motion includes regulation is fee caps is one way to regulate fees, but there are other ways to regulate fees that were discussed at the subcommittee level. Um, so I think we're just leaving it open that there should be some regulation, I think fee caps or regulation. Okay. Julia? I agree with that, but I would put a period after uh, those of attorneys. I think that it could not, I, I don't wanna limit this to middle-class consumers. So I would be willing to accept that if, as long as it's lower cost than those of attorneys. I'm fine with that and it still would need a second. Right, well, we will get there. I wanna hear some more comment first, um, Fariba. Um, I don't think this really is any different. We're still trying to impose a fee caps because we're trying to justify the end of creating a lower cost um, service uh, for folks in need of legal services. Listen, I am really concerned at, at my level out in the field that if we make this too hard for someone to make money at, and the LDA statute is not allowed to sunset, we are not gonna attract people to this profession. Look at the licensure and education requirements. Why would anyone in their right mind wanna do this when they can just be an LDA or even fly under the radar and be a form preparer and make money? So we've gotta look at this from practical lens. What is, what is this gonna do out there and for people like Elizabeth and, and professionals like her and, and those, we want people to come into this business to provide good service and lower costs if uh, there are other changes made to the program, but this is artificial. Stephen, may I ask you, are you in agreement with um, Amos's resolution or no? You, you read my mind. I would be if he added the concept that this is for the legislature. Yeah, I don't think that Amos is going to add that concept, but I shouldn't speak for it. But him. I'm fine with the rest of it. Yeah, the problem is it could be done by the courts and it could be done by the bar. We're just running out of time with this working group um, and, and how, how fees are determined or, or how it's discussed, I think should be up to the board of trustees. So Justice Petro, in the interest of consensus, I'm fine with Amos's language. Okay, so let's remove um, Stephen's language from the top there so that the motion that we're currently looking at, which I understand does not yet have a second, although unless Stephen, you wish to now second it? I'll second Amos's motion. Okay, so it's Amos's motion with Stephen as a second so that we know what the motion is. Um, Stephen, was there something else you wanted to say? Or nope. All right, Ira? Very simply, um, Amos had to... Uh... Uh, explain the word regulations. And so maybe we ought to say <laughs> fee regulations might make it clearer to readers. And, and before, any, before that gets written, Amos, are you in agreement with that amendment? That's fine, yes. And Stephen, are you as well? Sure. Okay. And is there anyone who still feels that we cannot vote on this before talking about in-court representation? Okay, I'm not, Ira, your hands up, but I think that's just because you didn't take it down before, correct? All right, 
So with that, um, Linda, why don't you go ahead and take the vote? Okay. Um, Bashan? Yes. Reynoldson? Yes. Thomas? No. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Abstain. Uh, Bish Harper? No. Um, Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? No. McRae? No. Olvera? No. Judge Rubin? Judge Rubin is not with us. I'm sorry. Uh, Robinson? Abstain. Um, Shining? Abstain. Sarush? Abstain. Spiro? Yes. Um, Judge Wiley? No. Um, okay, so we have one, two, three, four. Um, the motion does not carry. Can you please tell me what the vote was? Um, yes, there were one, two, three, four, five yes. Um, one, two, three, six no. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one, two, uh, three abstentions. Only three abstentions? I believe so. Oh, yeah. Hamilton, Shining, and Sarouche. I okay. believe it's the same. All right. Okay. Robin, Robinson might have been an abstention. I think. Yeah, so. Robinson. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So four abstentions. Yeah, that's what I had counted. That's why I just wanted to make yeah. sure, since it was a close vote, I wanted to make completely sure we're all on the same page regarding the vote there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that did not pass. Um, Leah, do you want to bring us to the, your next topic? Yes. The next one in court representation. So here, the recommendation is twofold. One, two. I'm sorry, one second. Um, Stephen, do you have your hand raised for, is there something you wanted to say right now? No, it's an anticipatory raising of my hand. I would like to chime in early on this one. Okay, but <laughs> please don't, I mean, in all, I, I appreciate that, but don't feel the need to do that because when I see people's hands, I call on them, okay? Um, so we know you're gonna wanna say something. Leah, go ahead. Yes, so the in-court uh, representation recommendation is to modify modify and eliminate the concept of a default position, but it's simply, uh, simply establish a universal position that in-court representation is allowed in the form of responsive representation. So if the judge or the bench officer asks the paraprofessional question, they can answer it, but they are not able to make affirmative arguments. Um, I think it is pretty clear that the discrepancy, the variance in what paraprofessionals are allowed to do in different case types pursuant to the recommendations as they're currently drafted um, is viewed as problematic and confusing to have that much variance. Um, and so this uh, proposal attempts to address that by creating a standard format or, or standard uh, proposal for what will be allowed in terms of in-court representation. In doing so, it does ratchet it back down from affirmative advocacy to responsive representation. So that is uh, their proposal. In-court responsive representation only, but the same approach regardless of case type. Okay, um, with that, Stephen Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I've given this a lot of thought. I, if some of you recall some of my initial comments on this where I was very concerned about the reality of getting the necessary legislation passed if we included in-court representation. And I offered different scales of what we could try to do. And then I read the letter that was jointly authored by Senator Umberg and Assemblymember Stone. And they tell me very clearly the chances of getting our paraprofessional legislation passed if we start allowing the paraprofessionals into the courtroom is very limited. And I would hate to see that the two years we have spent on this group, those of us that have been here from the beginning, to be all for naught. I think that's going to become a rallying cry just as the ownership of firms was going to be. I think that in-court representation or assistance is something that can be added once the program demonstrate 
demonstrates that it is producing quality assistance for individuals who, whether by choice or for economic reasons, wants to want to use paraprofessionals. So I'm going to actually make a motion that we'd be more dr drastic and say no in-court work, uh, even if it's sitting at, uh, next to the person as a support person, because I'm very concerned that that is going to be a fatal blow. And I understand our goal is to try and create a program that is not based on trying to predict polit political tea leaves. But when I see something that strong from the legislative leader of, both, of the Senate and the Assembly jointly, and based on my experience of dealing with legislations with for multiple organizations, I do it for the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, Southern California chapter now. I previously did it for the uh, Flexcom, the Family Law Executive Committee. And I'm, I'm concerned that, that this could be a provision that results in our entire program being voted down if it includes in-court work. And I think ultimately, if we get the paraprofessionals introduced and the, the judges see that they are doing paperwork and it's of good quality, then the voices that we heard from like, especially uh, Judge Wiley, where she says, I want these people in court. It's gonna be easier to add that afterwards rather than including it at the beginning of the program. Thank you. And to be clear, you're making a motion and the motion would be that they can't even be sitting next to them in court to answer questions directly from the court? Correct. Okay, um, I'm sure we'll get some comment on that, but uh, I think we need to have a motion written. So Linda, could you do that? Yes. And while Linda's doing that, um, Stephen Fleischman? Yeah, two things. Number one, could, Leah, could you clarify what the staff recommendation is on this issue with respect to jury trials? In other words, I think the only jury trial left in the program is unlawful detainer. Would a paraprofessional be able to sit at council table and address questions from the court in a jury trial? Um, well, I have to be honest. I thought jury trials were excluded altogether. I don't thought think so I, too. I don't think I. I don't think I caught that they were. Well, allowed. no. I, I. I think they are. I'm asking if that's changing that. No. Okay. So it's not I, changing the other um, exclusion. So no jury trial, just a, a bench trial is still allowed. Bench representation in a bench trial. Okay, so what we have in front of us right now was the recommendation from staff that in court representation be limited to responsive representation. And then I guess below that we can put the motion that was made and I want you to tell me exactly what your motion is so that Linda can write it. Uh, as soon as Linda is ready for that. And maybe instead of deleting, just put it as down as, the, there you go. Um, you can go ahead. Okay, paraprofessionals are not uh, permitted to participate to participate in court proceedings or to sit at council table with clients. Okay, uh, Fariba. And, and procedurally, can we get? If I can't get a second, we don't have to discuss mine. I, I second it. Okay, now now it's open for discussion. Okay, Fariba. Okay, so um, I'm in favor of uh, limiting in court representation to responsive representation sitting at the desk with or, about, with or without that responsiveness. I think support inside the courtroom is gonna be what's meaningful about this new, new program. I think without it, we are creating a more educated group and trained group of non-lawyer legal service providers. And that's wonderful too. And if that's all we can do out of our group, I'd be happy with it but, and okay with it. But I really want to see a palpable change out there for these folks. And you know, limited in-court representation is what I would support. And, 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 and that, when you, so Fariba, I want to be clear. When you yeah. say limited in-court representation is what you would support, what yeah. do you mean by that? Does that so, mean? So I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, Justice. no. 
um, Petra, uh, I was just saying, uh, sitting at the table, and I would, I'm a little bit on the fence about responsive representation, which means at the request of the judge, if the judge has some questions, um, I think I really like Judge Wiley's comments about her experiences and perhaps her, co her concerns would be alleviated if we provide that recommendation uh, with regards to a judge. So, being so where you're clear to... on is that you think that the attorneys, the, excuse me, the paraprofessionals should be allowed to sit next to their clients yeah. to be yes. able to provide real time support and you know, the ability to converse with their clients you're not so sure about the responsive. Is that correct? Uh, that's that's correct. And I'm addressing some of the public comments that we received today about this. I mean, with regards to present, you know, preparing exhibits and being ready. I think this will uh, this will able the um, this will enable the uh, litigant to to be ready um, okay. to represent themselves. But I, I just just. One last thing is that with regards to the letter that Steve refers to, I'm just not sure how much that letter represents the voices of all of their constituents versus just the voices of the lawyers who are against this proposal. I'm just not sure if I okay. counted those comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Judge Wiley. Hi, yes, I, you know, I, I was, uh, very, very adamant when we last spoke and addressed this issue with respect to my experience. And, you know, I want to reiterate that, you know, of the 13 years that I've been a judicial officer, eight of those years have been spent uh, in family law. And the, 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 the dynamics in family law, I think, is, is so much different um, from really any other area of the law. And, you know, I've seen hundreds, if not thousands of cases that could have uh, very greatly benefited uh, from having in-court representation above a support person, above someone who you know is sitting in the back, um, someone who's there, able and capable uh, to respond to specific questions that a judicial officer may have, um, so that we can have information in order to make more accurate decisions. Um, you know, our ability uh, to do any kind of investigation uh, from where we sit is is non-existent. Um, so information uh, is really the gold standard in terms of how we make these decisions. And what we're potentially doing is cutting off that, the ability of judicial officers to have that information. Um, in my mind, the only reason uh, the prayer professional program would be a success is because we do allow that in-court representation and those people to be benefited uh, from people who not only worked on the papers, spoken with the clients and investigated their cases, but are able to communicate that to the judicial officer. Um, otherwise, the, the, again, I, I think you do a, a great disservice uh, to the program and to the litigants that we are supposed to be focusing on in improving their circumstances and decreasing that access gap. Thank you, Julia. Um, I agree with Judge Wiley. Um, I regret having to disagree with my friend, Stephen Hamilton, <laughs> but I really think that this is one of the linchpins of this whole program. This, this to me is very, very important. And I think if this is going to get through as something, I, I mean, I appreciate the fact that there are many people who are concerned about this new profession. And I just think though, one of the greatest gifts of this would be at least for them to go into court and respond to questions from the court. So I, I, just, I just think this is one of the most important things, especially, I, I just, we've got to provide assistance, not just to the client, but how would it would assist the uh, docket move forward for judges. And I just think this is one big answer that could be a primary assistance to that. All right, thank you. Um, let's see here, who have we not heard from? Judge Harper? I just wanted to uh, say, I agree with Judge Wiley and Julia. Uh, I think the, the success of this program is going to be allowing people to come into the court and to have the ability to communicate their case successfully with a judge, not successfully, but at least communicate their side with the judge. And 
many people don't have that ability, but having a paraprofessional there with them, being able to prepare the documents, but to be in the court, to not just support them, but to be able to present their case, I think is, is to me, what's gonna make this a successful program. And so I think the in-court representation, allowing them to present is what's gonna allow people who don't have the means to be able to have that access to court that we're talking about. Um, so to me, the in-court representation is, just, is a linchpin of this entire program, and I'd hate to see that go away. All right, thank you, Sharon. Um, I actually agree with um, Stephen Hamilton. It's just a matter of how far we go. And I actually thank staff for really looking at the consistency across this program. And right now we're fairly inconsistent and that just, I think, creates confusion amongst the public um, in terms of what their paraprofessional can and can't do, even though we do have disclosures. Um, so I think that maybe splitting the difference and making sure that um, paraprofessionals can still provide a very valuable service is having the paraprofessional sit with the person as a support, exactly how Steph um, phrased it, and then gathering outcomes and looking. And at a later point, because I, I really hear the judges and what they're saying, maybe at a later point, adding that in, but we have to get to that point where there is a program and um, a proven track record from pair from pair professionals in order to go that far. Julie. Thank you. Um, I would not, I would vote not to change our original proposal. Um, and that includes in court representation. It is not limited to uh, responsive um, representation and answering questions from the judge. Um, I find that it's of interest to me and of great persuasiveness to me is the fact that most, if not all of the judges on this working group support in court representation. I'm not sure we need to wait for years uh, to and collect data to know what the judges views would be. We already have it. And I would vote to leave our proposal as it is. All right, um, Ira. I'm concerned about uh, what Steve Hamilton said about the letter from the uh, two legislators, but um, I think that, that it's, it's very likely that if uh, the legislature gets comments from judges, many judges, uh, supporting in-court uh, representation, that that is likely to influence the legislature to go along with it. Um, or at least not to ding the program because it's uh, because representation is included. All right, thank you, Ira. Um, Stephen Hamilton, your name's been taken not in vain numerous times, so take it away. So uh, I want to emphasize, I agree. First of all, I'm sure you're still good friends with everyone, regardless of where they <laughs> fall on this. No, I, look, and maybe I'm reading the tea leaves wrong, but I, and I agree, the ultimate goal is to have that in-court representation, because I've been a family law practitioner for 25 years, and I absolutely know that what Judge Wiley is saying is true. But to me, making sure that we get this program enacted is, is the first and, no, and number one goal. And I, I am very concerned that this is going to be such a hot button issue that it is going to seriously damage the chances of the legislation to enact the paraprofessional provisions from passing. And so my idea is I kind of want to, I think it was Kimberly made the comment about, you know, creating a track record. I think, I don't think it's five years off or 10 years off. I think once we have paraprofessionals in there and the judges have seen their paperwork for a year, and now there is anecdotal information to submit to the legislature about how more efficiently it is, has been presented. I think it would be a much easier uh, bill to get passed that's isolated to the one issue of in-court representation. And, and I am, uh, you know, again, I'm repeating myself, but I have very serious concerns about the program bill being passed if it includes the in-court representation or participation. I think if for no other reason, we know that that's a lightning rod with attorneys and it, it is gonna get a lot more attention and it's gonna make it more difficult to pass if we include this from the beginning of the program. My recommendation is you could include a you could include a recommendation that after one year of the program that the uh, it's requested that the uh, state bar revisit the issue of in court representation 
put a timeline on it. But if we leave it in here, I, I think we may end up with no program at all. Thank okay. you. And, and I appreciate that. And I'm going to say for the last time, because I know I'm repeating myself, that it's not going to be up to us. It's going to be up to the state bar what they're recommending ultimately here. Um, uh, Sharon? Okay. Sorry, I just didn't lower my hand. That's okay. Um, Stephen Fleischman and then Elizabeth? Yeah, two points. Judge Harper, Judge Wiley, I mean, I get what you're saying. I hear you. I just have a slightly different perspective for you to consider. Whether it's the most important part of the program or the second most important part, I've always thought the linchpin of this program is going to be hiring someone to help you settle your dispute with the other side, which doesn't require in-court representation, at least most of the time. And so while the lack of in-court representation may have a downside, I still think there's a lot of value to the program in terms of helping people get, um, get their disputes resolved. The second point I wanna make is after our program came out, Oregon released their proposed program. And it seems pretty obvious to me, they were watching what was going on with our program and they picked the good parts and they picked the not so good parts in my mind. And um, I, I sort of really like their program. It's very focused. It's just unlawful detainer and family, nothing okay, else. But let's not, but let's, let's and, try to keep our conversation focused on this. Yeah, and as it relates to in-court representation, they adopted the Washington model rather than what we were proposing. That's it. Okay, Stephen Hamilton, did you have something further or was your hand up from before? Okay, um, Elizabeth? Hi, thank you. Um, so, so as we know that over 85% of people are representing themselves in court, so people are showing up with no representation at all. And so that's why, um, that's why we're here. Um, we wanna solve that issue um, and I'm citing from a report, um, the statewide action plan for serving self-represented litigants published by the Judicial Council. Um, and basically they highlight some of the benefits of um, how can we help these self-represented litigants help themselves. And, and by having full in-court representation, we can do this. And some of the benefits are, you know, we're gonna be able to save time in courtrooms. Um, this is like from the judges' mouths. Um, and um, there, there's going to be a reduction of inaccurate paperwork. There's going to be an increased ability to identify conflicting orders. There's going to be an improvement in the quality of information provided by the litigants um, in their case. There's going to be a dis diminishing of inappropriate filings. There's going to be a minimized unproductive court appearances, lower continuance rates, expedite case management and dispositions, promote settlement of issues increase the court's overall ability to handle its entire caseload. So this is um, would be a win for the court system, the self litigant, you know, it's 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 a no brainer. Um, and again, I've said it in previous meetings that, you know, just because we're allowing in court representation doesn't mean that this is where all these cases are going to end up. Um, when you have paraprofessionals um, having the ability to give legal advice to the public directly then um, you're ensuring that the consumer is getting the best representation possible for their specific issue. And so that's gonna promote settlement. That's going to allow the paraprofessional to have those discussions to help the consumer make the informed decision that's best for their case. And sometimes taking these cases to trial, or sorry, not trial, but taking it to court is not the best interest of the client themselves. So that's just what I want to say. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I do not see any other hands. Linda, could you please take off the screen the top part, which is not the resolution, so that we just have the actual resolution to look at? Um, before you do that, um, I think I'd like to make an alternate motion to for the staff proposal, which is the top part. Well, I don't think we can do an alternate motion. You can seek to move to amend the motion on the table, and then that can be accepted or not. And then you can certainly make another motion after this one, but I don't think we can have two motions on the table. 
So just point of order, I, I obviously defer to you as a chair, but I think the typical way it would work is if there's an alternate motion with a second, that that would need to be voted on before the original motion. Uh, I'm going to turn to Leah, Greg, others in regards to that. I, I am not a Robert's rules expert, so I can't, I, I don't think Greg, Greg is not going to opine on that for us either. So okay. yeah, I certainly am not aware and I'm not saying that you're incorrect, Amos. I'm not aware of an alternate motion needing to be taken first. Um, but if you can point us to something, I'm glad to look at that. Um, why don't you express what your alternate motion would be so that the people moving this can can consider whether they wish to make any modification? My my alternate motion would be the staff recommendation. So what was just removed from the screen, which is um, to modify the proposal regarding in-court representation to allow for responsive recommendation only across the board. Okay. And is there, uh, so that I understand, would there be a second for that motion? I would second that. Sure. Okay, that was Sharon. And so regardless of order, um, I think we understand that there are two motions to be dealt with. Uh, do the folks with the uh, initial motion wish to make any changes to their motions, having heard the discussion and where we are right now? You're muted, Steve. Sorry, I was look, looking at the Roberts Rules of Orders. No, I did not wish to make a change in my initial motion. Did you find the answer in the Roberts Rules? I'm not seeing where the alternate motion displaces, but I'm not done looking at LACPA's chart. They've got, actually, I got a cheat sheet that I'm looking at. I think it's a separate rule of order than a, a, a proposed amendment. It's an alternate motion. Okay. I understand that, but do you have something that says the alternate motion gets voted on first? I'm going to ping Brady, um, so I'll, I'll do that. I don't, I don't think and meanwhile, um, and, but we do, you know, I, I, we are going to lose a couple more people in the not far future, so I would like to move ahead. Uh, whatever order we do it in, we'll do both. Stephen Fleischman, was there something you wanted to add? I, I was just going to ask that the Hamilton, it seems to me logically the Hamilton motion should be voted on first, but I defer to you as chair. Well, that's what we're going to do unless someone pretty quickly shows me a rule that says otherwise. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have them here, so. Okay, so we don't have a rule that says otherwise, um, and we are we will take a vote on both, okay? So that everyone understands that after taking the vote on the Hamilton motion, we will then go to the Amos motion, which is what the staff had recommended. So yeah. Linda, starting with the Hamilton motion, which is a modification to provide that paraprofessionals are not permitted to participate in court proceedings or to sit at council table with clients. If you could please take the vote on that. Sean? No. Uh, Brennelson? No. Alma? No. Weissman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? No. Hartston? No. Kirkmeyer? No. McRae? No. Olvera? No. Robinson? I'm not sure if Nicole is still. Oh, you're muted. Maybe she stepped away. Okay. Um, uh, Shining? Yes. Sarouche? No. Spiro? No. Judge Wiley? No. Okay, and I see uh, Nicole, did you wanna vote? You came back on for a minute, but you're still on mute. Nicole, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself. And if not, um, I think the vote was, was not very close. Is that right. correct? Okay, that's correct. So, the yeah, so it would not make a difference uh, one way or the other. And I see the judge you was with us as well. Um, so now as to, if we could please put up the, um, and yeah, let's make sure we're only looking at one thing at a time. So this was the recommendation by staff that, um, was moved by Amos. I think Sharon, did you second this one? I did. You did. Okay. And this one is a recommendation regarding in-court representation. 
representation to limit it to responsive representation defined as sitting at council table to support and advise clients and with the ability to answer direct procedural questions from the judge. Okay, so Linda, if you would like to take a vote on that. Okay, just give me a moment. I'm getting the voting split sure. ready. Can I just speak to this before we vote, Justice for True? Sure, I, yes, and I did not mean to cut off conversation. I thought we'd had, but Dana, why don't you go ahead and then Julia. I just wanna point out the word procedural. So now yes. we're limiting judges to procedural questions to the paraprofessional. And I think that's a mistake. We're going to allow paraprofessionals to write motions, submit them, and we're not gonna allow a judge to ask substantive questions about them. And, and Dana, I think that is, a, you're correct. That word is absolutely in there and has that meaning. Um, I'm taking your comments as a request to have that word removed. I'm going to ask um, Amos whether or not uh, he would like to leave the motion as is. Well, I think we could add uh, factual or procedural. Would that Can we not just sense? say to answer direct questions from the judge? Yeah, that would work, yes. So if you remove the word procedural, Sharon, are you okay with this as modified? Mm. Sure. Okay, Dana, did you have something further? Okay, if you could take your hand down then, please. Um, Julia? Oh, that's just what I wanted. Okay, Thank so yes, yeah, so psychically it was done. Hello, Judge Yu, what would you like to tell us? Um, I just wanted to thank Dana for that um, recommendation. And, you know, when we had our debate, I was given the role of arguing for full in court representation. I'm glad the recommendations in the report acknowledge that the bench officers were pretty unified in that. And I think that this is a necessary step to take to move forward. But I, I hope at some point we'll be able to um, allow for more assistance for litigants in the courtroom, because it's not really a David and Goliath situation where the lawyers and the paraprofessionals are the jail, the the David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. Without paraprofessionals, the David and Goliath situation is represented people and unrepresented people. So thank you, Dana, for um, that recommendation. Okay, is there, um, Elizabeth just raised her hand, Elizabeth. I, I just wanted to clarify, um, if we vote no for this, um, basically we're saying don't limit it to um, responsive. So if you vote no, then we don't, then you haven't changed the prior recommendations. Okay, these uh, resolutions are, or these motions are to change the recommendations as they currently stand. And so if any resolution does not pass, then the prior recommendation remains. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Um, I do not see any additional hands. So Linda, whenever you're ready. Okay. Bashan? Yes. Bertelsen? Yes. Felmuth? No. Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Judge Harper? No. Uh, Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. McRae? No. Olvera? No. Robinson? Uh, Shining? Carolyn? We lost Carolyn. Okay. Carolyn, you're muted. Oh, it, it just unmuted and then muted again. Oh, there yeah, you go. Sorry, um, new device. Um, Epstein. Um, Sarush? Yes. Byro? No. Uh, Judge Wiley? No. And Judge Yu? No. Thanks, Linda. Sure. So we have one, two, three, right. four, five. Seven no. yes. One, two, seven, four, no. five, six. Seven no. Okay. And one abstention. So it does not carry. Well, Judge, you, I mean, Justice Petru can vote. Not no, I oh, that's right. Know that's, is that correct? It's, it's tied. It's a tie. Um, do we know that for, I want to be very clear with the procedural rules here about what happens in the event of a tie. 
because it could be that it does not carry or it could be that someone needs to vote but i and i'm glad to vote but only if that is the appropriate thing for me to do nicole's um, picture is still on the screen who's nicole i understand that but nicole has not been responding yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is my understanding, but if we want to- uh, and Do we have Brady available to us or no? I don't, he, I mean, I-, I Can been, you call him? Yeah, I will. Sorry to make everyone pause, but um, we, we need to do this the appropriate way, whatever way that is. Judge you, you have your hand up. Erica, Erica is your hand up? Yes, um, it's a new hand. Uh, depending on what happens and whether or not Justice Petru can cast a vote with a tie, which I believe we had said that she could in the past, um, I'm willing to discuss again or to change my vote because yeah. although I feel strongly, you know, I also want this to move forward and to not, not be impaired in any way. So I believe there had been some conversation before that perhaps I could vote that has actually never happened. So it was uh, it was never put to the test, which is why I'm um, hesitating without having Brady available. Brady, if, can, if can I have something, he's Sorry? Jumped, he's jumping on. He just okay. told me okay. that the answer is yes, but he is. Is there? On. Can we? Is it possible that we can take a lunch break before? Because I think you're right. Everyone needs to really think about this. Well, I, we're going to lose more people. Judge you is, for example, trying to juggle a million things today, and we're going to lose her if we take a break right now. We're going to lose Judge Wiley, and I think we may lose Judge someone else. If Brady is available okay. right now to answer the question, let's hear from him. I see Brady. Hi, everybody. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, working on some other matters. Uh, I, I understand there was a question about uh, ties. In the and event, yeah. So the question is, when there is a tie vote, does that mean it does not carry, or does it mean the chair should be voting? Um, yeah, yeah. Typical state bar practice uh, with uh, with working groups has been the chair's uh, vote to break a tie. Okay. Thanks very much, Brady. So, no Judge, you, um, I'd like to know what your vote is, so that we know whether there's a tie or not. Since you were uh, starting to say something, my vote stands. Since I don't. I uh, need to change it for any reason. Okay, anyone else? All right, my vote on this is no, so it does not carry. And we will, um, I'm sure that uh, Leah will bring back to the state bar board, or I will if I'm part of that conversation, that this was essentially a tie vote. And we will likely, um, excuse me, we will likewise, not likely, we will likewise um, share the votes on all of these, including the one that was the one that was a close vote this morning, so that people know. Um, okay, I, I agree with Carolyn that a lunch break is probably in order. But before doing that, um, Leah, do you have some sense for how much more time we would need today? Yeah, I don't think we need that much more time if you wanted to try to continue to go through to power through because. We haven't, uh, as staff, teed up any other issues to talk about substantively today. Instead, it was to get some consensus around the, the process moving forward. Staff's proposal is that to reorganize the comments so you'd get yet another uh, filter in the Power BI, um, and that would be uh, co comments raising new arguments or, um, or facts. Uh, versus ones that don't. And the idea would be that we would prioritize taking up as a working group those uh, new arguments, new facts, and that we would just schedule the next meeting such that we would start to tackle those topic by topic. Um, that being said, I do anticipate needing some significant amount of time between now and that next meeting because I, this is the last thing I'm going to ask Linda to do is to categorize the comments in this way, allow you to review those and then to uh, suggest modifications, right? If there's something that we haven't flagged as a new argument, a new fact, you could put it forward and we would add it, et cetera, so that you can weigh in and make sure that everything that you think uh, should be categorized 
uh, in a certain way is actually done so. And then we would have a schedule a meeting and depending on the volume, it could we could need one meeting or two. Um, I haven't seen that many things that I think are truly new. So I so as I sit here asking you that, I realize we also have not had the opportunity to discuss as a group, you know, excluding these large buckets of like, is there a justice gap? Like yes. those kinds of things, which we probably should be discussing. So my inclination, and I apologize because I do know this means that we're going to lose at least a couple of people, but my inclination would be to take a short lunch break or you know, stretch break, whatever you want to do with your break. And then reconvene just to talk about are we on the same page about excluding certain buckets of things um leah may want to raise a couple of the things not not for decision today but just to give us a sense for some what are the, the additional topics may be and um, anything else that anyone wants to chat about is that okay but if, if people would prefer to just push through right now you know i, I can do that too so i really would like to be deferential to whatever the group prefers as a whole. So speak up. I prefer push through. I prefer a lunch break. <laughs> push I through. My preference. Or even five minutes to just go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. I need a snack. Standing here. <laughs> okay. I'm going to cut the difference. Let's just take a 15 minute break. Okay. okay? Thank um, you. So that people can get a little break, but not a long one. So we'll resume at 1240. Thank you.
Okay, let's give it another minute or two because it's just barely 1240. Okay, so um, if you're if, if folks are back, can they please turn on their video? All right, Kimberly, are you there? And Carolyn? There's Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. Stephen Hamilton's got his, no, not talking to us, talking to somebody else. Um, okay. So, Leah, do you wanna take us through kind of the, um, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. I wanna make sure there aren't folks who think that we should be addressing these kind of big carve outs. No, and uh, thank you, because I, I think that last, um, session uh, discombobulated me a bit there is there we did actually intend to ask the group to take votes on this approach to exclude certain uh, types of comments from consideration per uh, the recommendations outlined in the memo so I skipped that step so we could put up um, I think Linda has uh, dropped resolutions to that effect it, uh, essentially um, the recommendation is that you not uh, consider new practice areas, consider comments related to whether or not there is a justice gap, and consider comments really related to whether or not there needs to be a legal, a new paraprofessional at all. And I, I um, drafted this as two resolutions, one having to do with practice areas and, a, and the second one having to do with the justice gap and whether there's a need for paraprofessionals. But if you prefer, I can put it all in one. No. no. Um, Leah, before I start taking comments from the group, do you want to explain to us kind of the the, yeah. the basic thought behind this? So for with respect to new practice areas, I just don't think there's time to consider a new practice area. But as, as you all know, it took us a long time to uh, come up with a list of practice areas that we do have. Uh, so that's the basis for that recommendation with respect to the justice gap study, the need, whether or not there is a justice gap, why there's a gap. I don't think that's relevant to the charge of this working group, which was to establish the parameters for a paraprofessional program. Similarly, the you know many, many comments about um, whether or not we need a paraprofessional at all, not relevant to the charge of the working group. The charge was to develop a proposal for a paraprofessional. So uh, that's the basis for staff. So I, I think maybe it would make sense to um, break this out. And before we do that, um, I see one attendee with their hand up. Uh, anyone who's uh, attending who would like to make comment, if you could please raise your hand at this time so that I can see how many people there are. While I wait for people to do that, Leah, I think we need to break this into buckets. Um, so for example, you know, perhaps we could have a conversation about whether we need to do anything on the whole, is there a justice gap? You know, start from there. You want to start with that one instead of well, it's not, I'm not, I don't want to say how we're going to do this. I'm just saying to put them all together. I don't know that that's going to work um, for folks. So well, why don't you okay? So on the screen is the resolution regarding practice areas. Okay. And the rationale for that has to do with insufficient time to vet a new practice area. 
Okay, so let's pause on that for one moment. We have two people who would like to make comment and I'm going to go ahead and do that. A reminder that it's a maximum of two minutes per person. Um, so Linda, if you could let, I believe Dawn Anderson had a hand up first. If we could have Dawn go first. And, and uh, Justice Petro, unfortunately, when I was trying to work on the chat, I gave over hosting the meeting to Louisa. Right. Who I believe stepped away for lunch and hasn't quite gotten back yet. So I can't unmute. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm here. I'm oh, here. you are. Okay, I apologize. Sorry. So whoever is doing this, however we're doing this, if we could um, allow uh, Ms. Anderson, I believe you're unmuted. Yes, I'm unmuted. And thank you all for gathering. I appreciate all your efforts. My name is Dawn Anderson. I'm an architect in California. I'm an uh, California access specialist and I'm a subject matter expert and I work closely with attorneys across the, the state and I work in an area that's called a accessibility construction related uh, regulation. And uh, I don't know if you or a close friend of yours has been exposed to frivolous litigation in California around construction related um, issues dealing with accessibility, but this is another subject area that I think is deserving for uh, this group's consideration. Um, I often um, I have to stifle myself to provide advice to my clients on legal matters. Um, and the, this is definitely an area where someone with my expertise could assist people, most of them minority small businesses, in what is required to not only abide by the laws, but also how to walk through uh, a lawsuit, which could um, in turn close their business. So I, I just want the uh, group to uh, consider it. Uh, other, if it's not something that can be open for debate at this time, I really, really appreciate the support of paralegals and, and your work to help disenfranchised groups all over California to get their fair share in the legal system. Thank you. Linda, are you running this? Oh, Louisa's doing it, she, and she, I think she's on it. Hello, uh, uh, members. Uh, this is Angela Grijalva, and I, I'd like to do a two-part comment. The first component being, one, the fact that we're back here uh, under political pressure, um, I would say political duress, to come back and have to redo all the amazing work that this group has done, even portions of it I didn't agree with in the past. But um, I, I want to really identify that that's what's really happening here. And I appreciate the comments that um, that rebut that and say, hey, this is a political issue that needs to be handled in the political venues. Um, and so the other component, I want to speak to the uh, naysayer uh, public comments um, and one of those being was the attorney general. I really, uh, I thought it was um, poor taste and just uh, an inadequate uh, measure to try to say the immigration consultants and use them as an example to what this paraprofessional would be. Uh, immigration consultants have no educational training requirement. They just had to put down a bond and then they are now practitioners, if you will, scriveners of immigration documents. So the paraprofessional by no means is uh, a, a measure to that, uh, as you all know. And it's, it's disheartening and it's, it feels like the AG didn't even do any of their homework when writing that decision. Uh, now to the other component of the argument of ownership, I won't speak to, but um, the comparison, I think that's a political statement because there have been multiple bills in attempts to eliminate and eradicate that profession. Um, and so that's that one component, but uh, I, I wanna thank you all for all your hard work. Uh, I have been really disheartened by seeing some of these, uh, some of the members here do the their circuit and some of the privileged comments that have, uh, they have been seconds. to stoke the fires uh, of, of discrimination and privilege. Um, and it's it's very disheartening. And I would call into question those memberships participation or those members participation in this group. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we have any other public comment. Is that correct? I think, um, no, I guess not. I believe we already took the two whose hands still appear to be up so we can get those hands down and return to our group. 
Okay, so now back to this. Um, what Leah has up here is the uh, essentially proposal that we not try to get into new practice areas at this point in time. So focusing on this, um, Ira, your hand is up. Yeah, um, I think what we mean here is not that we're um, going to exclude from consideration the comments but that we're going to exclude from consideration the recommendations in these comments on various subjects. Another, another thought I have is that it, a lot of us have probably read it, maybe all of us have read the comments that we're talking about here, so we have considered them. Um, and it's, it also kind of looks bad to say we're not considering I think you're right. comments. I don't mean to cut you off, Ira, but I mean, I've certainly read them and I'm not normally a voting member of the working group. I'm sure others have read them as well. So I do um, appreciate what you're saying and think that it would be more accurate to say that the recommendation is that we not um, seek to expand the program, expand the recommendation into new practice areas or something like that. I mean, Leah, I leave it up to you, but I mean, Iris, right. It's not that we haven't considered the comments. Right. Um, practice areas be excluded from action. Um, no, no recommends that no additional practice areas beyond those included in the September 2021 recommendations. Um, that no additional practice areas be added to the program. I don't know. Be added to the pilot program, right? This is a pilot that we're recommending. It, we'll remember it's not exactly a pilot, well, a phased implementation. Phased, a phase, yeah. But you added to the initial implementation phase. Oh yeah, or initial implementation, whatever. All right, did you wanna say something further? Okay, then take your hand down if you don't mind. Is there any further discussion before? Um, and Leah, you're, you're asking for a vote. Does that mean that if you're asking for a formal vote, we need a motion, do we not? Yes. Okay, is there someone who would like to so move that the we'll working- move. This is Fariba. Okay, so Fariba, is there a second? second? Yes, I'll second. I think I saw Dana's hand and then I heard. Um, so I, I know I saw Dana's hand for sure. Is that correct, Dana? It is, I'll second. All right, so we'll have Dana be the second on this one, and then Linda, whenever you're ready. Okay, Sean? Yes. Reynoldson? Yes. Uh, Falmouth? Yes. Uh, Fleischman? Yes. Hamilton? Yes. Uh, Judge Harper? Yes. Hartston? Yes. Kirkmeyer? Yes. Uh, McRae? Yes. Olvera? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Shining? Yes. Sarush? Yes. Spiro? Yes. Judge Wiley? Remember, Judge Wiley has left okay. us for the day. Okay. Um, and Judge Yu? Yes. Yes, okay. I am. Thank you, Linda. Thank I, you. I, the I, motion I, carries. Just so you know, Linda, I'm going to leave about 1.20 to go back to court. So I'll be okay. here until then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, so that one was an easy one to count up. Um, Leah, what would you like to address next? Um, well, I, I kind of defer to you. There's the justice gap, comments regarding the justice gap, and comments um, regarding whether or not we need a paraprofessional at all. And I think Linda asked. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, it. these are to me these are things that are clearly outside of our scope. That you know, we were told um, there is a justice gap, and we were told come up with your best proposal. Um, but I, I mean, is your intent behind this, Leah, that we're not spending a that we're not spending time discussing at this juncture whether there is a justice gap or whether there should be any proposal at all? Right, because we have over 2000 comments, right? So I'm trying to create an organizing construct to figure out which ones we're actually gonna spend time on 
um, you know, keeping in mind that the goal is ultimately to figure out, are there going to be any revisions to your recommendations to send forward to the board? So, I, you know, and from my point of view, comments related to whether or not there is a justice gap and whether or not we need a paraprofessional program are not going to inform your recommendations. The right. I mean, I certainly I do. I do want to say I appreciate the fact that so many people wrote in on those topics. OK. Um, so for, you know, because it underlines kind of people's views on the importance of there being a program or what kind of program there should be. Um, so to that extent, I certainly don't think that it was a waste of anyone's time to write those comments. And I think it's important. I think it's important for the state bar to be aware of those comments. I think it's important for the legislature to be aware, you know, when we get to that stage. So it's not to say that these are irrelevant comments, certainly not from my point of view, they're not irrelevant. I think the question is, um, can we use them in such a way as to inform any modifications to our recommendations? You know, do they need to be a, a standalone topic? Uh, before I try to take a, a motion or anything like that, let's hear from some folks because we have a number of hands up, starting with Kimberly. Oh, or not Kimberly, where'd you go? I was just gonna make the motion, so I'll wait until there's- Oh no, if you wanna make the motion, go ahead. Then I make the motion um, that staff is recommending. Um, we appreciate all of the comments that everybody has raised, um, but we do believe that the existence of the justice gap is outside of the jurisdiction of the working group. Okay, and would someone like to second that? I'll second that. Okay, great. Okay, so um, Julia. Oh, well, I second that. So that was uh, the point. I don't think that's within the jurisdiction of what we were supposed to do. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, Carolyn. Okay. So I have uh, three, two questions and a comment. One, do we have some kind of statutory obligation as a public um, entity in order to make a comment or to address each of the public comments that were made? Um, the second is, um, will these um, there were letters that had multiple comments in them. So there'd be part A, part B, part C. Um, so does that mean we're not gonna count those in regard to our total tally? Like Justice Petra said, will in a way that reflects our final consideration, make sure we include letters that are have multiple topics in them. And the third is just a comment in, along those lines, I think. Um, I guess it's a third question. How do we make sure that the data in that, um, um, the interactive charts that we were given, how do we make sure that's preserved? And will this reconfiguration of the, um, of the letters that are being considered, will that be, um, will that over erase the, um, the pie charts and the drop downs that we got or will it, be a new set of um, data that we'll be considering. Okay, so let me let me try to jump in for one second, and I'm going to turn to Leah. Um, my understanding is it's not that an entire letter goes out the window because there is a comment in the letter talking about the existence of a justice gap, um, and I because I can't imagine that would be the case, and someone's going to correct me if I'm wrong. I uh, would like um, Leah to respond. And, and also, I don't know that this, there's not a new set per se, but it's going to be a further distillation of the information. But if um, Leah or Linda could respond to the questions regarding uh, you know, how this is being done, whether there's going to be a new set, whatever you wish to say in response. Yeah, I, so I, I could address. address. Well, I, let me start with the first one. Um, there, there. I, I like uh, the fact that for the previous motion, we changed the construct to um, remove the notion that we wouldn't be considering comments because we, I might have also read all the comments. So I think we we have read the comments. So we, we need to change that language. But there is no statutory requirement or other requirement that we take specific action based on every single comment, if that's what you were asking, Carolyn. Um, so I think that the, the proposed approach is, is not sort of out of line with any statutory direction. Um, and then regarding the, the, the second question, Justice Petru responded, and that is correct. So an entire comment wouldn't be thrown out because it included um, statements regarding the justice gap or the 
viability of a paraprofessional program, but uh, those aspects of the comments would be coded accordingly. And so that goes to your last question. The data would be preserved as it is with all the filters. That's all in, in a tool called Power BI. Behind that is a massive uh, spreadsheet, essentially. And Linda can talk to this if she's where she's coded the comments in multiple ways so that it feeds up into those filters. So these would be new codes that would be added. So you could, you know, they're going to be added to the drop down list and you can filter accordingly, but nothing would be removed. And uh, Linda, if you want to clarify anything that I said. No, that's all I was going to say. There are going to be additional filters added. So nothing is deleted, nothing is removed. You'll still be able to filter the information in the same way, um, but there will just be new options for filtering the comments. Okay, that makes one more question, but I'll let other people in, uh, ask. I can't see who else is in line. Carolyn, do you have more question about the data gathering or the further distillation of the data? Well, my question is a bigger one. Why do we need to have this resolution at all? Well, I have the same, I have the same, I honestly, I have the same question, which I'm hold, I was holding, um, but you um, jumped, you got there faster than I did. Um, it's, but, the same, uh, it's the same as before. So we have thousands. Well, but it's not the same as before, because, you know, one thing that we have done before is say, these are the uh, types of cases, okay? Or these are the types of practice areas. We certainly have not said before, the justice gap is or is not an issue for us. Let's take a vote on that. Or um, whether a licensure program should exist at all is or is not an issue. So to me, it, this is not my view personal. You can just, everyone can disagree with me. This is not the same as before. I agree with you, Leah, that we've all looked at these comments. They're valuable. They inform people's um, views on the particular areas. But as I've said in meetings before, our time, in my view, is not best spent on is there a justice gap or not, because we were given a mandate that says there is a justice gap, put together your best proposal. So to debate whether or not we should have a proposal at all or whether or not there's a, you know, a justice gap to me is not the best use of our time or what we've been asked to do. Um, so I'm not sure that we'd be getting into this, but if you have a concern or if we start going down that road, I mean, I understand that we have limited time you want us to use that well. Amos. Thank you. Yes, I was agree I, I want to agree with you. And that was the comment I was going to make. I do not think we need this motion. Uh, we have a charge. We're working to our charge. I think we can decide how to practically use our time going forward. But I am also concerned that I think we've made it clear in the recommendations and certainly in some of our discussions that uh, this proposal is not a silver bullet, that uh, it needs to be done in combination with other ways of addressing the justice gap that we think the bar should consider. Um, increased funding for legal services, actually there's a list, but um, you know, I think it's important, uh, also not undermining the right to counsel movement. We do have resolutions about that. There are things that we've said about that, and I don't want to undermine that. Stephen Fleischman? Hi. Justice Petro, as you know from emails I've sent you, I have concerns about how those databases were put together. I don't know if this vote on this resolution is the time to discuss those. It probably isn't, but somehow we're talking about those databases. So I, I defer to you, is this the time or do you wanna put that off till later? Well, I mean, we're talking about the databases because Carolyn raised com completely valid and important questions about um, is data going to get preserved? How are we going to move forward? You know, all the questions that have already been addressed, um, which I think were well-timed and, and we all want to have that information. Um, I don't know, I, and I certainly want to give you the opportunity to make your comments, but I don't know, is that pertinent to kind of the question on the table because I am going to, once comments are done, I am going to turn back to the people who made this motion and ask them if they would still like to make the motion or not. Could I, in the interest of moving forward, could I ask that the database issue be put on the agenda for our next meeting, whenever it is? That our next meeting may very well be our last meeting. And so if your comments about the database issue um, would be impactful towards how the further sorting happens, I think we should hear from you today because the any further data um, uh, sifting, I don't, I'm not thinking of the right verb, 
would be happening before we get back together. All right. Well, look, my concerns as a whole about the data is that for reasons I don't understand, three different sets of questionnaires went out to the public. And I'm using the word questionnaire generically, but people were responding to three different sets of questions. All of them have been combined into one. And, you know, I've had people go through the data and come to very different conclusions. And I have issues with how people are being characterized. Somebody brought up earlier today, you know, we have a letter from 24 legal aid organizations opposing the proposal and it's counted as one. Um, the letter from the attorney general, apparently someone checked the box as not taking a position, but I think if you read the letter as a whole, uh, they, it should be characterized as against the proposal. So I have all sorts of issues with that database, and I'm very concerned about um, including that database going forward without it being fully vetted by this committee. And if at the end, the majority decide, yeah, we're comfortable with the data and how it was put together, that's fine, but that, that's a very long and complicated discussion. So what, what I'm gonna propose is we deal with what is on the table now. The next, uh, issue is to figure out the process moving forward. Um, and I think that that is the appropriate juncture to talk about the additional filtering of the data and any concerns uh, related to that process. So, so I, I, I agree. I agree with that. So I'm going to hold that for the moment. Ira? Yeah, um, I think we do need this motion. Um, there's a dissenting opinion uh, by Steve Fleischman that makes a lot of interesting points. Um, and, it, and it talks about a lot of the stuff Steve just said, but it talks a lot about whether there's a justice gap, justice gap or knowledge gap in one point it says. So um, because that's in our official September, whatever it was, um, uh, document, I think we do need this motion. Okay. Um, any other comments before I turn back to the folks who made the motion? All right. Um, shall we go forward then with this motion? Or do you have any modifications to it? Um, I do see that it wasn't actually modified to remove the certain language in it. So the way that it currently reads is that our working group affirms that questions regarding whether or not there is a justice gap in California, as well as whether the creation of a paraprofessional licensure program is a valid method to address the justice gap are not within the scope of the working group's charter. I, I continue to be somewhat uncomfortable in the sense that the charter says what it says. Um, and, but. This was, this is a change that I think Linda made to address the desire to remove um, that these topics wouldn't be considered. The right. intent behind the staff recommendation was not to reaffirm the charter. The intent behind the staff recommendation was to, to um, get consensus from this group that we are not going to spend our time talking about whether or not there is a justice gap and whether or not we need a, a paraprofessional. That was the intent because I think we need some decision rules to help us navigate the, the steps ahead. This, this is, I agree, like we don't need a resolution that reaffirms our charter. Um, but I think Linda was just trying on the fly to take out that concerning language about and is your concern, is the underlying concern that we do not think it's um, the best use of Linda or whoever's time to go through and collate all the comments saying whether there is or is not a justice gap, for example? Well, not just that, but I don't think we we want to necessarily encourage our, this working group's time in meetings yeah. to be spent on that topic as well. And so Leah, so before I turn back again, again to the people who are actually making this motion, what is your recommendation as far as the language here? Well, the original motion, which I, which I don't remember what it was, but it just said that they wouldn't be considered. And so I think um, I'm not good at wordsmithing on the fly, but it's something 
keeping the original motion, but just changing that language about they're not going to be considered. The comments have obviously been read and considered, but they aren't going to be that maybe it's the same parallel language we used for the practice areas. Recommendations regarding whether or not there is a justice gap or whether or not a paraprofessional licensure program should be created will not be um, acted on or considered. I don't remember the language from the- no, the, the language is not gonna be able to be identical, but- um, Can I make a friendly amendment? Sure. For that purpose? Okay. so. My friendly amendment would be to change the last part here um, after the last comma to be, will not be further addressed by the working group. Okay. So I'm sorry, it, I'm not sure. You, it, so it, you're right, after, you, right after the word justice gap. Uh -huh. Okay, just remove that and remove the comma as well. Uh -huh. And it will read, will not be further addressed by the working group. All right, so now I forgot who made this motion. It was me and I, I accept it. And how about your second? It was Julia, I believe. Julie, are you with us? Yes, I am. And are you okay with it as modified? Yes. Okay, Ira, then Carolyn. Uh, this implies that we have considered those two subjects. I think we have, uh, but uh, just uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not absolutely positive. So I just want- We haven't to had any motions on it. We it's certainly a topic that has been discussed. It's certainly a topic that's come up in public comment and, and certainly it's been discussed but we also uh, certainly have not had any motions as to whether or not there's a justice gap or whether or not there should be any program at all. Um, Carolyn, and then Stephen Fleischman. Deep breath. Um, very clear. I am against anything that suggests that we don't have freedom of speech on this group. We're a public group. We have a charter. Anytime that someone has brought in something that the chairs, the boat, our prior chair and this chair I thought was taking us off course have been mentioned. I've been, I think, pretty good at that. <laughs> so um, not always, but um, I really think this type isn't, well, to the extent that anything we do is entitled, entitled to tell someone what to say and not say, I don't think anybody intends that, but to, I think this really is outside what is viable in a public agency setup group. Okay, and, and, and to be very clear, um, it's certainly not my intent to tell anyone what to say or not say or what you can say or can't say. Um, and that being said, though, I do view it as my job as chair to try to help move the process forward. Because otherwise, you know, we're all going to be, you know, talking about this, make sure we all go to the same retirement home so that we can continue the conversation, <laughs> right? Um, absolutely, so, honor, absolutely. That's why I tried to count yeah. it very diplomatically. <laughs> no, I appreciate. I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I appreciate where you're coming from. Thank you. Um, Stephen Fleischman has his hand up. Yeah, I think we did have extensive debate about the existence of a justice gap, and it came up in the context of deciding what areas to include in the program. So, for example, personal injury and employment were largely excluded because there's a wide number of attorneys available to represent individuals uh, on a contingency basis. So, you know, I think we did consider those things. That's why I included it in my dissent. Um, having said that, well, I'll just leave it at that. And um, Julia? You know, I was thinking about this. Is it any way we can say this without using the word recommends, could we say something like the paraprofessional working group um, is not going to be making any recommendations regarding the validity of a justice graph or the necessity of a paraprofessional licensure program as it is not considered matters for decision-making of 
the working group. So maybe cut, make it into a decision making. We do not yeah. consider it part of our. Uh, well, you know, I, I, you know, so just to kind of react to the comments that I just heard, you know, it, it is clear that, of course, we have. And, and you know the person who said that we consider this in regards to deciding what's practice areas and what people could do. Absolutely, it's not that we have not had discussion about the justice gap, what that entails, what areas of law um, is that particularly problematic in, how much availability is there of other resources. So certainly these topics, um, in particular the justice gap and what is that and what. what about Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say it has absolutely informed what we're doing. I think what we're struggling with, and I continue to struggle with whether we need this, but you know what we're struggling with is what we're trying to say at this juncture about what we're doing moving forward. Leah? Yeah, I was just thinking about a different construction of this resolution. Um, it could say the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group resolves that the question or re resolved and then strike the Maybe you could not do that right just yet, Linda, or resolved and then strike that that the California program working group recommends. It could just say resolved, comma, the question regarding will not be further addressed by the working group. Because it's just awkward with the California paraprofessional working group recommends. Would that just kind of. Um, Julia has her hand up. No, I was going to say something along those lines of resolved the California paraprofessional group uh, concludes that no re uh, uh, official or whatever recommendations from the group will be uh, made regarding the existence of a justice graph or the need for a paraprofessional license or portfolio. Uh, program at as it is not considered part of our charter. And Leah, sorry to go back to you, but and sorry to be a pain about this, and sorry if I'm being dense, which we all know will not have been the first time that that's happened. Um, what is the goal behind this? What is the goal behind having a motion along these lines as far as moving forward, whether that's the data collection or whatever? Because I don't think anyone's going to be putting forward a motion at this meeting or next about whether or not there's a justice group or whether or not we should be making a proposal to the state bar about a licensing program. Well, um, that's good, but I think there were many scores, hundreds, probably in the thousands of comments questioning whether or not there's a justice gap and whether or not we need the program at all. So I, I'm simply trying to take the discussion of those comments off the table because I think we could spend hours debating the validity of the justice gap. That's all I'm trying to do. We're yeah. already spending a lot more time on this. Right. Tonight. That's and that's my concern because you know, short of someone wanting to make a motion on one of these topics, I'm not sure that we'd be spending a whole lot of time on this. Um, Julie. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment that um, I believe one of the earlier resolutions on these issues used the word affirms rather than recommends. That might be helpful. And, and it, it, can I add something? Go ahead. If, if, if Le Leah, if, if the concern is uh, the sort of um, the organization of the comments, I don't know that this is necessary because if, if the next part is adopted about that, we're going to um, organize them based on whether it's new information or not, this just would fall into it's not new information or argument. It's and so not, that can, my concern is not about the organization of the comments. It's just that I didn't want to spend hours in a meeting talking about whether or not there's justice gap, which there are many comments to that effect and other data points. But we can table this, and you know, if that becomes an issue where we end up having people want to talk about that, perhaps we can um, address it at that time. Uh, Julie, your hands up. Julia, 
Yeah, my only reason for wanting to address this now is because of the quantity of comments about this. And I would think that the board would appreciate that we have acknowledged, or at least that this is our position, that making an affirmative statement regarding the justice gap in California or an affirmative statement about the need for a professional licensure program is not within the charter of this working group. I think that will show we have not just to them, but also to the people who submitted those comments that we are responding as we've been asked to do. Carolyn. Um, you're muted, Carolyn. Sorry, you're still on mute, so we can't hear you. So Amos, let's hear from you while Carolyn sorts her um, audio. Yeah, I think this would be a big mistake. I don't think we need it. And I think this is gonna turn out, if we pass something like this, the lightning rod, right? This is gonna be what is pointed to, to say that um, throw out the recommendations because, you know, and start over because it was never considered whether or not there's a justice gap. And I think that's just not accurate. No, it's not, not needed. It's not, and not needed. Okay, I just, I'll ditto, ditto Amos. <laughs> okay, um, Julia? I'll withdraw my second and I agree now with Amos and Carolyn. Let's just leave it alone. And, um, sorry, go ahead. No, if someone else wants to, to second it, I, 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 I appreciate what they've said. And if it is going to cause more problems than solve, then let's leave it alone. This is Kim. Um, unless staff absolutely needs this for some reason, I can withdraw my motion as well. I just don't wanna put Leah and staff in a position that later on there was no discussion on those comments and any outcome. Um, so if Leah, if you're okay with no, no motion, then I am okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the path forward right now. Okay, so then I think you had one more kind of category, Leah. No, those were the categories. First. That was it? I thought there was um, something about not, topics not previously raised or Yes, yeah, so that's the next is sort of going forward. The, the, right. Those were the categories for exclusion. So now is the time to talk about how we're gonna consider essentially the remaining comments. And my recommendation is to prioritize those that raise uh, new facts or new arguments. Um, that will require uh, additional um, categorization and filtering of the data. Um, so I think that the decision for the group to make, Linda, can, I, I, can we not put something up quite yet? The decision for the group to make is whether or not in principle, you agree with that approach. And then I think this is the time to have Steve's conversation about the categorization. I will say that I, I believe Linda made the underlying data set, the spreadsheet available to everybody, or at least on request. I know that was provided to Stephen. I would not uh, categorize the issues that you raised, Stephen, as massive and significantly uh, different um, from what Linda had done. So I want to be careful about the characterization there. But I think we're, we're very open. The data set can be made available to anybody. People can provide their opinions as to how things should be coded and categorized. But the, at the end of the day, what we need to do, if you all agree that we should prioritize comments that raise new issues or new arguments, the comments now need to be categorized in that vein. And that's my proposal for what the next step would be. Okay, um, Amos, then Stephen. Um, there were a couple topics that I would, I think had many comments on that probably are not technically new uh, topics, but I think should be part of our discussion. And the two that come to mind right now, I'm looking through my notes, but two is the evaluation and how an evaluation is done. I think that 
clearly from the comments, and I, and I agree with the comments, needs more consideration by this working group uh, in, in what an evaluation looks like. And the other is the, the cost and financial viability of the proposal. So I, I think even though those aren't new topics, I think it is that those should be prioritized as well. In, in regards to cost and financial viability, which is something I know that has come up before, um, what role do you see our group playing in that? Amos? So I, think, I think consistent with the comments, the question is how much, if we're making a proposal, how much would the proposal likely cost and how would it be funded uh, is, is I think the, the question. And, oh. and that I think that no, I, I completely understand the I, I totally get what the question is. I'm just asking you because I'm trying to understand, you know, we've had some conversation with Lee about that before. Obviously, that's going to be a big part of conversations going forward as far as what the state bar recommends and, and you know, everything that happens from there. Um, we are not going to be in a position to all of a sudden get a bunch of new information in the few weeks that we have remaining to us. So I'm just pushing, not pushing back, but I'm just curious, like, how, how do you envision, how, what do you envision us doing with that piece of it? Yeah, so I totally understand the practical limitations. I just think it should be prioritized for us to consider as this moves forward. And, and that might be, it might be a placeholder, but, but we should be open and honest about what we sure. think the program we are recommending costs and how it's gonna be paid for. Steven? Yeah, could Leah or Linda explain how we came about with three different public comment forms with different questions? I've never, I've participated in a lot of public Okay, comment. so you have the question out there. Let's let someone okay. respond to it. I can respond to that. So the initial public comment form was designed to elicit comments on each of the specific topics and, to, and the hope was that if people had a comment on one particular aspect and we did it by the tables of, of the recommendations that were included as an attachment that they would put their comments in that particular place. That is not how it was used. And what happened is people wrote comments wherever they wanted to about whatever topic. And so that ended up not being a useful way to sort things. And then in addition, and when there was an effort made by our Office of Strategic Communications to push the um, comment form and the request out to, for, to the public, to the non-lawyer public, uh, there was a request that we simplify that form. Um, and so that's why we made it so that we asked just some key questions rather than asking people to comment on the technical aspects of, you know, so that they would have to go and read every single part and every, every technical aspect of the form. And then I think the third super simplified form was based on a conversation that Leah had with one of the trustees about making it a much more simple form. And so that's where we ended up and it was very unwieldy to work with it. And then in terms of putting it into um, a spreadsheet so that it could feed it into the Power BI, we had to take every single comment. So if someone had multiple comments on one form, each one is, is listed separately. And if they had the same comment repeatedly, the same, if the same person said exactly the same, time, the same thing 15 times on the form, it's only showing up once in the report. But, but that was, that's how it came about. It is unfortunate, but... Um, we were, we were initially tried to model it on how we did the public comment form for changes to pr proposed changes to rules. And it just didn't pan out the way we had hoped. And I, and I also would say that there's a lot more awareness and intentionality, increasingly so, about the fact that we are a public protection agency, we are a consumer protection agency, our focus needs to be on the consumer and the public. And when we put out public comment forms that are designed for the rulemaking process, very focused on and geared towards lawyers, we're doing something that is not engaging to the general public. They open it up, feel intimidated. It's a whole bunch of stuff to read through and they don't engage. And so I, I think in the future, you will see the state bar doing at least two forms of public comment. 
One that is the very technical and very legal and one where we're trying to um, bring in the public voice. So it's, I, I think, yes, it's, it's, not for, it's not optimal, it's a little bit messy, but all of the raw comments are available for anybody to review. Um, and so I think that's what's important. And we did get more comment from the true public than any other state bar proposal that I can think of. So, um, so that's sort of what happened and, and the rationale for it. Thank you. That is helpful. But, you know, my, my biggest concern with all of this is I don't see how you take data from three different surveys and combine them all into one. At a minimum, they should be broken out by the three surveys. Otherwise, you have, I mean, we had extensive emails about how you identify people in what group. If they self-identified in one area, that's fine. If they don't self-identify, it seems to me they should be listed as unknown. And it seems like a lot of effort was made to try to characterize people where we really don't know who they are, um, how they should be characterized. And I just, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just very reluctant to present this the way it is now. So Stephen, I, I want to first of all thank you for the very thorough review and feedback that you had for the initial support and opposition. And I don't, I believe I sent a response where we we you know based on your recommendations, we took out all of the categories at least for the individuals. So it's just attorney and non-attorney. We don't have all of the other categories. I, I for the organizations, we I think for the most part, if you. You, I sent you back how I recategorized the organizations. And if there's still agreement, I'm happy to go well, back and look at those again. I mean, Linda, I appreciate all the work you've done, but let's look at the BI report, topic, subtopic. You know, there's a heading trade protectionalism. I, I mean, where did that come from? How are you, I mean, <laughs> there, there was no box for people to check. I want to comment on trade protectionism. I mean, I don't, I don't recall, you know, are you, I, yeah. I, I just think we would have been hindsight's 2020, but I think we would have been better off with one form that everyone could live with, or if you want to create a separate one for consumers and just stick with that form rather than attempting to interpret it. And I agree. And I think going forward that there's going to be um, that that effort, but that's not what we have now. And in terms of people self-identifying, I think that's a, a recommendation that, that I made was that we should, on, in future public comment forms, ask people, "Are you an attorney?" Or to, to to give some options. We didn't have that, and the only way, the only time we have the self-identification is if in the form, if in the affiliation, they said lawyer or law firm. And other than that, it really was just reading the comments and if they say I'm a lawyer or and, and many times looking people up in the, um, in the state, state bars uh, uh, profiles. I, and, so, and Leah, I, I mean, just, I, I don't want to rehash all of this. And I understand your comment that you got more comments from consumers than ever before, but at least the way we looked at the data, those were about 72 people. That, and that that I, I got it. And I'm, I'm telling you that that's about seven times what we usually get. I, 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 and I, and I get that, but I just, I'm concerned with like that tweet that the bar sent out, you know, making this, when you, when you do it proportionally without explaining the raw data, it, I was just concerned it was very misleading and no one in the working group had signed off on that. Now that's all water under the bridge and I don't want to rehash that tweet, but I'm just very concerned about how all of this came together and us signing off on anything other than the top number, top line figures. We received this many responses, this many were opposed to it, this many were, um, this many opposed it, this many supported it, this many supported it with changes. I'm, I'm very concerned about anything above that top level analysis. 
So to move this forward, what I'm going to suggest again is, uh, let me just ask, Linda, did you make the raw data fully available as well as your coding spreadsheet? I, my coding mm -hmm. spreadsheet is not publicly available. That but you made it available to Stephen? The coding spreadsheet? No. Okay, so I think we can make that available. Um, it, I, I'm pausing because I, I know that it's not going to be uh, helpful if people start changing it. So it's got it. We've got to figure out how to make it available. So this would be where you see where all the different coding of the comments, how they've been coded. We have full transparency around that. For the next meeting, we have a proposed language where we summarize, uh, not summarize, where we uh, specify what we intend to say about the comments for the working group's next report to uh, the board. And when I say what we're gonna say, I mean exactly what you were saying, Stephen. There were 2000 comments received from 1200 people. Of the comments, 80% were in support or, or it's opposition 20% were done. The high level, summary that is going to be coming from you to the board, we can have that language for your ne the next meeting for you to approve. And that will be all we say from the working group to the board. Staff may have its own additional report, but for the working group's position on what the comments, um, how they broke down or how they can be broadly characterized, we'll give that language to you at the next meeting. And, and Leah, thank you for all your help. I will keep an open mind. If we're just going to do the top level in the report, I can probably live with that. Um, Carolyn? Yeah, okay. So um, I just want to kind of um, think through or ask questions that Leah said. And, and throughout, we've sort of been commenting about lawyers in a particular way and to suggest that there should be two separate forms for lawyers and real people. I, I just find that incredulous, incredible, um, as if lawyers can figure out some super smart form and regular people need it to be dumbed down. So if the form was not written in a way that everyone could understand, that was a problem and that was done incorrectly. Um, but I just think that the concept and maybe going forward, if we do have further reports that will have public comment on them, and I don't know, um, you know, the, um, I, I totally disagree. Oh, shoot. Is, am I still there? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> My dad's trying to call me. Um, no, I just, I don't see the need. Um, if it was written poorly so that everyone couldn't get into it and understand it, I just don't understand, you know, kind of at some points, some, <laughs> there's no need to disparage attorneys in this group or, or suggest that one group of people is smarter than the other. I, that just seems that's, unfair. That's, that's not what I'm intending to suggest. I don't. I don't know if you are like me. I, I'm a, an, a lawyer. I consider myself pretty intelligent. But if I get a survey to that I'm asked to respond to, and it and it's pages of survey questions and many different subfields, I am not inclined to respond to that survey. This happens to many of us. You get surveys all the time. Whereas if you have a simplified survey that's a couple of questions, a couple of screens, you're more likely to respond to it unless you're particularly engaged and focused on the topic. That's all I'm saying. It's not about intelligence. It's just about <laughs> how vested somebody is in a particular uh, topic. I couldn't just, I couldn't agree more with you. It's just that if in this situation it was done one way and then for some reason somebody decided that it wasn't consumer oriented enough, then we should have stopped and redid it completely. So I hope in the, you know, if, if there was a mistake done so that it was hard for people to do, um, then let's not revisit that, that error. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. I just, there is no need to do one for smart people and one for people who get confused. And, and, and again, in, in hindsight, we shouldn't have done the first form the way that we did. But once it was out there, we received comments on that form. And so we needed to tally them. There was no way to convert the comments that came in on one form to another form. And so that's why we have all of them. And we had attorneys going back even after we had the other forms. We had attorneys commenting on all of the forms. Um, but uh, there were some attorneys, mostly attorneys who went back 
to the original form and put their comments there. And so I, I completely agree. If, if I had known that this would be the outcome, I would not have des designed the first form the way that I did, but it was based on our experience with soliciting comments in, for the rulemaking process. Uh, Nicole? No, I just wanted to just brief, briefly comment, Leah, thank you, you're correct, because sometimes as a consumer, if it's too, for me, if it's too, I hate to say legalese, or even if that's a word, <laughs> I don't know if that's a oh, word. It's a word. <laughs> <laughs> I might not understand it, so I appreciate the part as being a consumer to be able to accurately respond, so uh, I do understand that, and I appreciate that it was redone to make sure it focused more, not to say it's dumbed down or anything like that, but just so it's more understandable for a consumer. So I just wanted to make that point. And Amos. Thank you. I have one additional uh, category. So I, I mentioned evaluation of the program, cost and financial uh, uh, viability of the program. One other that I would like to pro uh, prioritize that I don't think would categorize as new um, is the disclosure of alternatives. So this was included in my uh, dissent on page 97 of the report and a lot of legal aid associations are really concerned that there needs to be specific information given about the potential availability of free legal services from a lawyer uh, to inform consent. So I'd like that to be prioritized as well. Okay, Leah, anything further? or any feedback that you want to solicit from the group for purposes of kind of putting together our next go round? No, I think this is good. I've got Amos's um, list. We are gonna go through and do we, the royal we, uh, Linda will go through and recategorize the comments per our conversation today. We'll figure out how to make that underlying categorization document spreadsheet um, accessible and uh, then what we will do is provide a list of the what we consider to be the new arguments, new facts, plus the Amos topics, and that will comprise the future agenda. And then people can uh, and the future respond. agenda will also include the exact um, rule changes being proposed as a result of the affirmative votes this morning, correct? Yes, as well as the language that would be used with the high level language to characterize the comments. Right, exactly. Okay. So, yeah, um, that's, that's the path forward. So we'd be looking at, um, we're going to end early today, which is good. Um, we are look, we'll be looking then for a date in April. So I'm just going to ask if, um, Linda could send that or whoever's going to send that out, start, you know, sending out that doodle poll sooner rather than later, because, um, speaking for myself, April has, is, I'm normally able to move things in order to accommodate what works best for the group, but April's a tough month. And I expect I'm not the only one for whom that's the case. So if we can try to lock in a date soon, that would be, I think, very beneficial for everyone. April is the cruelest month. I there think. you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Did you raise, oh, Julie, did you mean to have your hand up? I, I did, but it's just a, a comment to thank Linda for her heroic work, not only on this working group, but I know you have staffed many, many other working yeah. groups at the State Bar over your long tenure, and I just wanted to thank you. Thank and how you. long have you been with the State Bar? Not that long. It's just been six years. <laughs> it's a lot done in six years. Okay, so let's end with a round of applause for Linda. Oh, and then you. I'll see you all soon. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.